Gosh. All right. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the Fruit of City Council meeting. Um, so if everybody take a seat, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, uh, the time is now 7.01 p.m. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, Deb, would you please call roll? Councillor Buck is excused absent. Councillor Lenhart? Here. Councillor Harvey? Here. Councillor Cry? I'm here. For the record, Councillor Cry is appearing remotely. Uh, Councillor O'Brien? Present. Councillor Bremen? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we're gonna move into our moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. If you'd please stand with us. We'd like to take this opportunity for all faiths and beliefs, uh, the opportunity for a silent prayer. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? No changes to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. All right, do we have a motion to approve? Who moved? Second. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Councillor Cry? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right, we're going to move into our proclamations and presentations. Uh, so we've got two presentations tonight. Our first one is Fruit of Teachers and Students of the Month uh, for February 2022, and we've got the Fruit of 8-9 school. Uh, so with this, I'm going to come out front because we've got a student and a teacher that we're going to present to. All right. So we've got a certificate for uh, the student and the teacher, and we also have a pass to the rec center uh, and a button for them. But I wanted to go ahead and read what was written um, by the principal on each one of these, and then we'll have you guys, the student and the teacher, come on up once I get done reading these. Uh, so the student of the month is Reagan Gear. And so uh, Reagan Gear is one of the most mature and thoughtful young women who has ever graced the halls of Fruita 8 9 school. She can easily move from a thought provoking conversation about indoctrination and tyrannic, tyrannic, tyrann, wow, I have better be able to tyrannical right. governments to an honest exploration of her own generation's interaction with and dependency, and dependency upon technology. She's able to make arguments that other Others can follow with beautiful scripted writing or eloquent and passionate speaking. She is incredibly intentional about using her voice to advocate for the betterment of the world around her. And that is most definitely not a skill that is seen in most of today's youth. Reagan takes pride in the work that she is doing at school, not because of the in inevitable high marks she will receive, but because she genu genuinely and honestly wants to understand and learn. She's extremely motivated and a role model for other students. She is driven to be successful and puts her all into everything she does. Reagan is action oriented. She lets her actions speak for herself and to those around her. We are thankful for the contributions Reagan has made to our learning community. She's the exact kind of student we want leading our futures and we are deeply proud of her. So this was submitted by the principal, Jason Plantico. So Reagan, did you wanna come on up? Stay up here. So you're gonna to have to stand here. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give her I heart fruit a button. So she, and, does that. And one other good thing is I've got to coach her with cross country this last season. So I've um, got to get to know her a little bit uh, at school. And so she's very motivated. All right. So what we've got for our teacher of the month is Pete Ray. Uh, Mr. Ray is an outstanding teacher. He cares about every student and about making connections with each of them. He develops a partnership in the classroom and pushes his students to do their very best. He is all about helping students to develop into successful adults. Mr. Ray is an active member of the school community. He collaborates and sets goals regarding students' growth and achievement in the class and with his department team. He uses data to drive instruction and is constantly looking for best practice professional development to provide engaging ways to work with his students. Mr. Ray is witty and uses humor to draw students into his lesson. 
He leads by example with active involvement in school functions and events. Mr. Ray is committed to developing students through coaching, furthering the great traditions in Fruta athletics. Mr. Ray encourages students to strive to continue in expanding their experiences as, as they go through high school. He is a big reason why the culture at Fruta 8-9 is great, and he continues to work with students in becoming leaders of, of the building and their community. He is a true professional and a huge asset to our students and families. Mr. Ray is a wonderful teacher, and we are lucky to have him in the Fruta community, also by Principal Jason Plantico. So uh, are you here tonight? Come on up. Yeah. All right, let's give him another big round of applause. And I don't know if anybody wants any photos. Did you want one with everybody? Uh, no. Yeah, come on. No? no? <laughs> All right, thank you for being here tonight. And gave a really big smile. Yeah, that's great. All right, that's one of the fun things we get to do. So uh, we appreciate being able to support our students and teachers here in our Fruta community. Um, our next presentation is our, uh, again, back with youth. Uh, we've got our Fruta Youth uh, Action Council. And they're gonna go over our go goals uh, for 2022 and some of the highlights and what they did this past year. So I'm not sure who is Mark gonna present or you've got some other they're going to present. All right. Don't be shy. Step up to the microphone. <laughs> okay, we're going to start off with some introductions. Um, first off, my name is Raya Roberts. Um, this is my third year in FYAC, and I'm currently our standing in president. Hi, I'm Margaret, and I am a freshman, and I am the vice president this year. Hi, I'm Kaya, and I'm a freshman also, and I'm the secretary this year. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm in eighth grade, and I've been a member for two years. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ella Kinnick. I am a junior, and this is my first year as a part of the FYAC. Okay, so we're going to start off with um, some updates and highlights in um, the start of uh, our year so far. So this group has been going for three years. We currently have 13 um, members enrolled. This group this year has decided to elect three members uh, in three leadership positions. These leadership positions are president, vice president, and secretary. We like to focus on civic engagement through building social connections, working alongside. We also work alongside Rise Above Colorado. It's another youth group uh, that uh, focuses on kind of the same main goals we do. Uh, we like to put focus on positive community norms uh, to build more connections through our youth in Fruta. Um, we see the importance in building connections with our community's youth to bring us together for future functions like this. Uh, it's, it's really important to, for us to get to know each other because we're gonna be in the city of Fruta for most of us will be in the city of Fruta um, for a while. So it's, start, it's important to start creating those connections earlier. Um, we like to have a platform to grow um, our members' leaderships. Uh, we like to encourage youth uh, to get out there and make connections um, and have a voice in the city of Fruta. We like to, we bring a different aspect to the table um, when we're talking. We're a lot younger and we have a different view on a lot of things. We like to make that known. Um, all in all, it's been a really good start to our year and it's been a great three years for the all the three years that I've been in there. Um, and we've been working really hard to make it better. We do a lot of um, advertisements through Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we like to spread 
um, the knowledge of Fruta um, through those platforms. We also throw on some events uh, to uh, engage our youth in the city of Fruta. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some more um, highlights and things we've done. So at the, in fall of 2021, we did Splash Bash, which was pretty successful. And we had about a hundred attendees. Um, we're still working on creating some more events for our youth in the community, like movie nights. And we're trying to come up with a springy flingy, which is gonna be like barbecue yard games kind of thing. We've been volunteering in special events like Chuck and Treat and Cookies and Claws. We, at our last meeting, created some uplifting messages and goodies for Kick Week, which is Kindness is Contagious and is the week of Valentine's Day. So we can like go around the hall and pass them out to random kids at school. Um, we will be hosting the Fruit Student Job Fair at FMHS on February 23rd. Uh, it will give an opportunity for students to find some local jobs and help them with their future. And we are exploring some more local opportunities and brainstorming on ideas on how to collaborate with entities in the community. Okay, and I'm gonna be going over our successes that we um, got through these past three years. And through COVID, we have still accomplished a lot of things, which is pretty hard, but we did have a sticker scavenger hunt that was a success and got kids out and doing active things during COVID. And that was in 2020. And we also worked closely with Rise Above to complete that dinosaur um, mural on the Dino Dinosaur Museum in 2020 as well. Uh, we also had a very successful winter in Necessities and Coat Drive in December of 2020. And we got a whole two truckloads of clothes to bring to Homer Bound, which was really great. And in August, 2021, um, we were able to hold our first in-person event since COVID. And that was our Splash Bash and it was really successful. Um, and we also tried to meet every month from 2020 to present to keep, our, to keep our group motivated and moving and active in the community, which was really cool. Yeah. FYAC members are very passionate about volunteering. And as such, we work to create food bags for underprivileged youth this summer. We're going out and creating cards and goodies for the elderly. And we volunteer to help at many community events and we're hoping to host many community events in the future. A important part of FYAC is youth engagement and getting youth more active in the community. And she's gonna talk more about that. Okay, so upcoming, we plan to have a community potluck or as she said, a springy flingy. And they will have kind of yard games, BBQ, just kind of a way to get the youth together and just everyone in the food to connect. Uh, we also plan to have community games such as spike ball, kickball, softball that everyone can play. It's kind of a fun night. And then also on top of that, movie nights uh, at least twice a year, one of which we probably want to have like a Christmas movie night, which I think would be pretty fun. And again, more games such as geocaching, spike ball league, and many more. And on top of that, we want to participate in community feedback sessions and help City of Fruita Parks and Recreation Department gather information slash feedback regarding the upcoming Weed State Park and Weed Park Playground. Then I'm very excited with that. So yeah, we have a lot of stuff coming up and I can't wait to continue on. So um, that's all we have for you today. Um, we'd like to ask any questions, but before those questions, we'd like to thank Karen um, for being our liaison. Uh, and we'd also like to thank Brittany uh, for being uh, such an amazing advisor. She really didn't want me to do this, but um, she's, <laughs> she's really helped us um, a lot in getting a lot of things rolling. So do you guys have any questions for us? I want to thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, one question, how many youth are in your group? How big is your group? We have 13 current members. Okay. And how long are you trying, you're recruiting more, trying to get more? Yeah. Um, we'd always like to take more if we um, do our application process starting in the fall. Um, and then we'll, our spring, sorry. Uh, and we'll make our selections then. So we're always encouraging um, youth to come out for FYC. Thank you. Anybody have questions, comments? Ken? Yeah, I, I just want to thank you guys for serving your community. Uh, it's pretty awesome at such a young age to do that. So thanks, guys. You guys are great. Mm -hmm.
And I, I just have to say that just popping in a meeting every once in a while and watching what they do. And I mean, these are the true leaders uh, for us in the future. And I think we are gonna be in good hands. So thanks for all you do. Let's give them, yeah. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. You want to say a few things, Mark? Or you? No. All right. All right. Uh, that concludes our presentations for tonight. We're going to move into public participation. Uh, so this is time set aside for the city council to listen to comments by the public regarding items that do not appear on the agenda. Uh, generally, the city council will not take any action on these items. Uh, so if you'd like to, if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on something that's not on the agenda, now would be the time to do that. On up and uh, step up to the microphone, state your uh, name and address for the record, and we please ask that you limit it to three minutes. Uh, Matt Barber, 334 Crystal Court here in Fruta. Uh, wanted to take a minute over the last several weeks and months, my wife and I have spent a good amount of time just looking into just all the things that uh, you folks go through, all the requirements, all the uses of your time, just everything that you all go through. And just want to tell you, thank you so much for everything that you guys do. Um, it is sometimes an overwhelming amount of stuff that you guys have to go through and commit to in addition to your regular jobs and lives. So just thank you very much for uh, what you all are doing. Uh, also want to thank you just for uh, up opening up the meetings to a moment of silence. I think that's a great step uh, just for anyone, regardless of their faith or where they're at in life, to just kind of connect with what's going on here. So I thank you for that. And in light of that, I just wanted to offer up a quick prayer for you all, uh, for us, for as a, uh, a city. So just want to pray real quick. Father, thank you for every public servant involved in governing our city. Help them to see that they are your servants first and foremost, and please empower us as citizens to give them the respect due to their office, whether or not we agree with their political positions or not. Give our leaders grace to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly before you in all integrity. May they defend the oppressed, protect the virtuous, and discipline wrongdoers. Please give them to wisdom to enact laws and regulations that foster an environment where every citizen can flourish spiritually, socially, and physically. We pray that you would help our leaders to govern wisely, draw those who do not know you to an understanding of who you are, and those who know you to rest in your power and purpose for their lives. Bring them emotional stability, mental clarity, and physical endurance to do their work. Regardless of their faith, please bestow upon them your common grace and strength to effectively carry out their responsibilities to preserve peace and fruta. And Father, I just ask that they would continue to be uh, just an example and a light to us on how to serve our community, how to serve you, and to make uh, our city the place that you've blessed us with. Uh, just an example of um, just how great of a God you are and how great of a community we live in. We love you and pray this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt. Is there anybody else in the audience that'd like to speak on something not on the agenda? All right, hearing none, we're gonna close public participation and move into our consent agenda. Uh, so these are all items or conditions uh, or requirements have been agreed to or met prior to the time they come before council for final action. So these will all be approved by one motion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open that up to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on something on the consent agenda? All right, hearing none, we're gonna close that public comment and bring it back to council. Are there any questions or do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Cry? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. All right, uh, with that, so we're gonna move into our public hearings. So we have uh, two public hearings tonight. Both of them are quasi-judicial hearings. And so before we have our staff presentation, I just kind of wanted to give everybody um, the order on how we do our, our public hearings here, because uh, several probably have not been through one of these before. Uh, so we'll have our staff presentation, uh, which we'll present first, and then the applicant will present uh, after that, and then we'll open that up for public comment. Uh, we limit public comment to three minutes uh, with that. 
And then once we hear from all the public, we'll close public comment and bring it back to council for questions for either the applicant or for staff and that. Uh, so we just want to remind everybody this is a quasi judicial hearing it means we're hearing all the information and we're making a decision on the information we hear tonight. So um, it's important for public feedback and for both the applicant and uh, the staff presenting to present all the information uh, that we've got on these. So with that, uh, we're going to move into our first First one, uh, which is a new liquor license application, and uh, we've got Deb up to present on that one. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Deb Woods, Deputy City Clerk, and I'm presenting the applications from Mike's Famous Chicken for a hotel and restaurant liquor license and sidewalk restaurant permit. Pursuant to the state statute, uh, the local licensing authority, which is the City Council, shall consider two things when approving a liquor license. First one being the needs of the neighborhood and the desires of the adult inhabitants. And the second thing is the character of the applicants. Um, regarding the character of the applicants, uh, staff completed background checks on the applicants and those all came back all clear with all uh, law enforcement agencies. And uh, regarding the needs of the neighborhood, uh, the applicants submitted a survey that was signed by 36 individuals who all responded uh, yes, that they would like the liquor license to be issued. <clears throat> uh, the applicants also filed for a sidewalk restaurant permit with the city and uh, that paperwork did not get into the council packet. So uh, for the record, I did provide copies of that dais for you. You may have noticed in the council packet uh, in the preliminary uh, findings report that exhibits A through F from the law enforcement agencies uh, can, on the background checks were not included um, in the council packet and that is because the CBI uh, really started cracking down on the use, maintenance, dissemination, confidentiality and security of criminal history records. Uh, for non-criminal justice purposes. And so uh, those records can only be viewed by authorized personnel um, and they can't even be stored electronically. So um, just in case you were wondering about that, uh, there was a public notice poster hung at the, at the premises on January 7th uh, by the applicant. And there was a notice in the Daily Sentinel on January 12th, uh, advertising this public hearing tonight. So with that, uh, staff recommends approval of the hotel and restaurant liquor license and sidewalk restaurant permit for Mike's Famous Chicken, located at 233 East Aspen Avenue. And that concludes my presentation and the applicants are present in the audience tonight. Um, Mike and Jamie Williams, uh, if you would stand please, do you? Have anything you'd like to add? All right, nothing to add. All right. All right, with that, uh, we're gonna now open this up for public comment. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this item, now would be the time to do that. Shannon, we don't have anybody online either, correct? All right, with that, we're gonna close public comment and bring it back to council. Are there any questions on this item? All right, then do we have a motion? I move we approve the issuance of a hotel and restaurant, malt, business and spirituous liquor license and sidewalk restaurant permit for Mike's Famous Chicken, LLC DBA, Mike's Famous Chicken located at 233 East Aspen Avenue. Second. Councillor Cry? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Moving into our second public hearing. Um, so we've got ordinance 2022-07, a second reading, uh, an ordinance granting a major amendment to the Burn Heidi planned unit development PUD guide to increase residential density and allowed residential land use and a portion thereof. So we've got Dan Karras um, 
our city planner that's going to be uh, presenting on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Again, just for the record, my name is Dan Karras. I'm the planning director for the city of Fruta. Uh, before you this evening is the Fruta Muse Major PUD uh, Guide Amendments. It is application 2021-43, and then this is the uh, city of Fruta staff presentation. At this time, I do want to enter this PowerPoint presentation formally into the record. And then we have certainly received a number of, of public comments throughout the course of the time the, the packet was posted on Friday and to date. And so those have been emailed and, and, and are now uh, officially a part of the record. Many of those we were able to get in, did receive some that, uh, that the council now has and that will live with this application. So uh, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, this is the you know, project's description and location. It is located approximately at the address of 1138 18 and a half road. The original property uh, 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 used to be uh, 39 plus acres that uh, established the PUD uh, ordinance. And just for the record, that is a, a planned unit development zoning classification. And it has taken several different iterations throughout the course of, you know, kind of 2002 to present, uh, you know, specifically like it was it was planned for uh, a lower density uh, residential type development. And we can look at that more specifically in the bulk standards that were established with the, the PUD guide. But in 2019, obviously, a school was planned through uh, the public purpose subdivision process. Uh, by location and extent, which is kind of a different uh, subdivision process than typically uh, a city would go through for a land use per, uh, related proceeding. So we have had some changes in land use, I think is part of the reason why I wanted to make sure that that was, that was made clear, you know, that it were planned for in a different space when this, uh, uh, when this uh, zoning ordinance was passed in 2002. But nevertheless, there's a process to establish a planned unit development and there's a process to modify one. And since that it was zoned planned unit development in 2002, uh, the code contemplates essentially a major and minor planned unit development amendment. This would classify as a major amendment, which basically the trigger is you know, less than 10% or uh, really kind of uh, uh, sort of non-relevant changes that don't uh, specifically contemplate changes of use or increase in density or open space and park changes, things, things of that nature. And so obviously with the, with the application that is before you kind of going from a lower dense subdivision to uh, you know, kind of a planned site to accommodate 50 attainable housing rental units uh, on, uh, again, approximately 7.62 acres. You know, that is, that is a deviation that would contemplate, you know, us going through the major, uh, the major planned unit development amendment process. And so I just want to, you know, for the record, you know, embed some of the material or statements that were made in the project narrative. Uh, that specifically uh, state, you know, the the purpose and the vehicle and the financial vehicle in which uh, this is being proposed. So we have uh, the first uh, stating that the Muse is a mixed income housing uh, or a mixed income housing and uh, to create quality sort of housing uh, um, attainable solutions for people that are between 30 to 120 percent of AMI and then the financing vehicle being obviously you know, uh, an application for Chaffa, the Colorado Housing Finance Authority. Typically, a, uh, we would not contemplate this in our, uh, in our sort of land use process, but we do have percentage reductions in parking that are specific to uh, affordable attainable housing. And then uh, there's obviously uh, assertion that was that was made as a part of the narrative that that is the financing vehicle that is uh, that is uh, likely to be used or is being used um, in application form so 
just want to make sure that that's clear since in the narrative it was uh, stated that that application is due today and our public hearing is today. This is just a, a, an aerial uh, photograph uh, via our GIS that shows, uh, ironically, Monument Ridge Elementary School still under construction. And, uh, and then the site uh, being the 7.62, just uh, eastbound on K4, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of northeast of the, of the uh, elementary school. And then Oak Creek, uh, estates, which is to the west. This is a zoning map that uh, specifies the uh, applicable zoning classifications that surround this site. Uh, the green where Monument Ridge Elementary School is CSR, which is Community Services and Recreation. The white, which I'm sure the council and some members of the community would understand as community residential, kind of our singular residential zoning district. And then this Brown really depicting the uh, the planned unit development zoning classification and rural estate uh, to the north. So it kind of orients us where uh, where the zoning classifications are in relationship to this site. This is a site plan that was submitted as a part of the application that shows a series of ten um, uh, townhome uh sites that have uh parking kind of interdispersed around the uh, around the site with a trail system to the north again the north being towards the uh the canal and then the rural estate and then to the south being the uh the location in which uh, k4 is east and westbound that eventually um, intersects with uh, fremont so a series of amenities proposed throughout this clubhouse being one of them, uh, a, a pretty significant portion of open space and um, a, a play area with a, with a community garden. So obviously those amenities have been articulated in the project narrative. I won't go through them uh, in great detail, but, uh, but just wanna make mention that that is uh, what is being proposed. Specifically, uh, at, in the in the in the code, uh, we contemplate these uh, major amendments uh, basically through what was the original planned unit development, and then what are the deviations that are being requested or adjustments as our code specifies. There's three of those. There's a process uh, requests uh, to modify what would normally go through the final plan and then final subdivision. So the applicant has requested that the site plan, uh, which uh, would essentially be the site plan in conjunction with the final engineering um, and landscape plan and, and applicable uh, submission documents in conjunction with the subdivision plat, which would legally create that 7.62 uh, acres. Right now, that's just an exhibit that doesn't have a legal description other than the proposed acreage. The uh, Access circulation, which is essentially a codified section of our code that uh, doesn't necessarily contemplate uh, replacing or being replaced by any additional analysis. It's a level of service assertion in our code that uh, specifically states that if you've got more than 25 units or more than 250 ADT being average daily traffic or trips uh, that you would propose to fully platted ingress egress uh, which is essentially you know points that are specific to dedicated rights of way and then uh, the the third would be uh, the the parking related uh, reductions however there's a bit of nuance associated with that that I'll explain at a, at a later slide but um, and here's our later slide but uh, the 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 specifics around this is that in the in the project narrative uh, there is a the bulk standards that are specific to the townhome product townhome product essentially you know mostly being used uh, as a term of common wall legally subdivided by that common wall and sold that's not the proposal here um, you know so we have kind of a, a multi-family definition of the product that's being proposed but it really is a town home product uh, as is illustrated by the elevations in the in the uh, 
the project narrative. So that being said, the percentage reduction for affordable housing, you know, is as such where 41 parking spaces would be required and the applicant is proposing 75. To get into the layer of nuance with that, we, we typically see those percentage reductions more for apartment type complexes, you know, that might not be able to accommodate that much offsite parking. So that's, that's part of the reason why 41, I think, is, uh, has, has been built into our code over time. I think the applicant rep, uh, recognizes that there's some differences to the types of affordable housing development that they're proposing. So they've accommodated more of those, that same uh, kind of calculation, but more in the context of like a residential land use uh, rather than a multifamily land. So just by way of context, that would be 150 parking spaces versus 75. Um, this is kind of more of the nuance from the applicant associated with uh, the differences between the attached dwelling units classification in our code and then, you know, and then needing to include the multifamily dwelling units as a, as a use by right. Uh, we look at this as really kind of more of sort of uh, you know, the intent is, is not necessarily to, uh, to include all of those different things. It's to account for all of the definitions that they're represented by. I'm not gonna go through these in, in, uh, in, uh, in great detail. I just wanna make sure for the record and it is uh, thoroughly explained in the, in the staff report that the review criteria are as such one through seven, uh, that the staff has gone through each one of those and has found them to be in compliance with the intent of our comp plan and our code, or have specifically stated that they are uh, not relevant to the application that is being proposed uh, and are stated as such in the staff report. This is just a quick little uh, uh, due process plug for when the postcards and the property was, or when the postcards were mailed, property was noticed and it was advertised in the paper. And uh, again, uh, the, the physical posting on site and the notice buffer. And at this point, we did not receive any uh, review comments from our review agency partners, but all of the, uh, all of the public comment uh, and comment from outside agencies are in your packet or have been emailed to the council and become a part of the record. And uh, at the December 14th, 2021 meeting, the planning commission uh, voted uh, four to one uh, the no vote was uh, due to uh, traffic concerns and other statements that were represented that, that made their way into the meeting minutes. And uh, uh, much like that meeting, our staff recommendation is to uh, recommend approval to adopt ordinance uh, 22, uh, 2022-07. I won't read that into the record. Uh, and then we have provided a slide that is depicted in the cover sheet that uh, provide the options available to council. So with that, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. And we've got the applicant here. Hi. Good evening, my name is Alicia Hammett and I'm a planner with Shopworks Architecture, 301 West 45th Avenue in Denver, Colorado. I'm presenting on behalf of the developer Indie Build uh, for this PUD amendment application for a 7.682 acre portion of the existing Burn Heidi PUD to accommodate a new townhome attainable housing community known as the Fruit and Muse. And I realize I need to be sharing my screen. Apologize. I'm going to go ahead and bring Kim Pardo up with Indie Build, and she's going to um, introduce herself and then walk us through a few slides, and then I'll come back up here. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and thank you, Mayor and City Council members and staff and my team and our partners and supporters for 
um, welcoming us here today to present the Fruit of Muse to you. Um, we're uh, very excited about the opportunity to um, create workforce housing in Fruta. As many of you know, we've been working on it for a long period of time, and we're extremely pleased and excited for um, the creation that we've um, put together um, to reach out to the folks in Fruta that are in desperate need of affordable and attainable housing. Uh, I have put together a couple slides, but I'm not, I don't want to take up too much of Alicia's time. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Indie Build and our team and our supporters. Um, Indie Build is a community oriented, sustainable, and attainable uh, development company. And we are partnering with um, Vortex, Shopworks, Ryan Construction, and then um, the two below that are our consultants that help do. Um, our tax credit application and our market study. Um, so um, this team is really uh, experienced in the asset type that we are building and we're, um, and then Vortex is obviously local. So we are um, just uh, very pleased with our team and excited to uh, work together, to get this built. Um, our supporters and collaborators are combined here, um, but I just wanna highlight our partnerships. And so um, we call them community partners. And for us um, here in Frida, we've been fortunate to be working with the D51 school district since the inception of our interest in building in Frida. Um, and then most recently we brought in Family Health West um, and those two are, um, partners, community partners that we have affirmative marketing action plans with them so that we can help them address the needs of their um, workforce um, and employees to obtain um, attainable housing here in Fruta. Um, Family Health West has um, expressed a dire need for um, additional housing for their employees and their future employees. Um, and I think it was EPS that recently brought up to you guys um, in their presentation that 70% of the workforce for Family Health West has to commute into Fruta. Eureka is uh, affiliated with the McConnell um, Science Museum. They're our after-school programmer that will um, do academic STEM programming and then also recreational programming on our nature loop, which was one of the prior slides on the north side of our property were um, combining uh, some extra space that we had to reach our density to create a nature trail that will eventually connect with the Grand Valley Canal trail system, the multimodal trail. And um, we plan to make it a mountain bike skills loop um, as well, just because we have a mountain bike theme in our property. So um, that is our partnerships that we have locally. Oh, in addition, we also have Over the Edge and we also have a master gardener. Um, to program our community gardens. I just did this slide for you guys today because I was trying to figure out what to say to you. It's different than what you already know. And so I created this slide. The first slide is me in Fruta several years ago when I was younger. Uh, although I still go there to that actual spot all the time. Um, I've been coming to Fruta for 20 years. I consider it my home away from home and I, uh, I have a junior in high school and I eventually look forward to moving here. So I think it's, it's part of the story. I love Fruta and I love housing. And so it's only natural that I would want to build workforce housing in Fruta. Um, the second part of this slide is why 1138 18 and a half road. These are two questions that I've kind of received through planning commission and, and speaking with others. And I thought it was important that I address Y1138, 18 and a half road. And so I put a picture of our seller and it's too small to read, but it basically is a summary of his um, accolades, achievements and history with the D51 school district and working at the Fruita Monument High School for 31 years. And um, when I met with Omer Bernheide in March of last year, I met with him and his son, Charles. and. Um, Charles had kind of told him that I was interested in building teacher housing and Omer had not been interested in selling his property. His property wasn't for sale, but he did sell a portion of his property to D51 to build the Monument Ridge Elementary School um, and was uh, willing to do that, but not willing to sell to a single family home developer. So when he met with me and heard that I wanted to build housing and I was brought to him kind of through Vortex, through Robert Jones and through D51, through 
Phil Onofrio, who built the school. Um, he introduced me to, he took me on a tour of the school and walked me through the property. And I fell in love with that property instead of one of the school's properties that they wanted to dispose and sell to me. Um, Homer was very excited that we wanted to build housing for teachers. And the first time I met with him, he drew out what he wanted us to build for, um, you know, it's, it can't just be for teachers, but we have uh, obviously a marketing plan with them. He drew out a, a, a plan of what he wanted on the property for us. So it does have um, sentimental value and significance. And it is important to us that we try to build workforce housing um, in an area that we feel is safe, um, and generates the live, work, play kind of situation that we feel is really important and makes Buddha Buddha. And with that, I will turn it back to Alicia. So, this is just a summary of, um, this is stuff that you guys have already seen. It's a, co a compilation of um, EPS data. Uh, and we tried to show you the problem sort of in this presentation, as opposed to other presentations, which some of the audience might not have seen. We tried to capture some of the most salient points that we grabbed from the EPS report and from the Grand Valley Housing Needs Assessment that was done um, last year. Um, and obviously, I touched on the, the Family Health West's um, need for housing in Fruta for their employees. And um, it's in addition to Family Health West. They're at 70%. The EPS found 68% of all Fruta's workforce housing commutes to Fruta. And we have um, we have discovered, you know, all these other facts as well that make it so important and dire for um, workforce housing to be built. And on the right side is just how we plan to solve the problem, which, which is through the Fruta Muse. Um, scratching the surface, but it's it's our solution that we think is a good start for Fruta, in addition to you guys creating a housing authority and really coming up with other creative strategies. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. So just to uh, reiterate staff's presentation, um, the site is uh, located east of Monument Ridge High School, north of K4 Road, it's a couple miles from where we are tonight. Um, this amendment includes changes in the siting, bulk standards, density, and character of the site that was not foreseen at the time of the adopted Burn Heidi PUD in 2002. These changes are needed to accommodate this future workforce housing development. This request supports the Fruta and Motion Comprehensive Plan's 2020 goal for providing a variety of housing types, affordability, and supporting infill development. This PUD amendment meets the city of Fruta's approval criteria and is consistent with the efficient development and preservation of the entire PUD. The existing PUD allows single family attached dwellings by right. On page four of the PUD guide, we provided a list of by right uses for the PUD amendment. We intend to build 50 townhome units on the property, but do not plan to subdivide the property into individual lots uh, for each townhomes because this will be a rental product. Because Fruta's code, definition of single family attached dwellings require each dwelling unit to be located on a separate lot, we asked planning commission to consider an amendment to our application and add multifamily dwelling uses by, by right. The planning commission recommended our application for approval as amended, and we respectfully uh, request that city council do the same uh, to ensure that this is a Chaffa funded affordable housing rental community. Um, this is Sorry, this is what the existing uses were. And this is the site plan. Um, the proposed site plan, as uh, Dan stated in his staff report, uh, are 10 townhome buildings um, containing 50 units um, on a 7.62 acre parcel. Vehicular access to the site is provided from the extension of K4 Road. The K4 collector will proceed east, west through the property to the eastern property line. There are 1,500 feet of trails, a clubhouse, community garden, and play area for future residents. The site will comply with all city, uh, federal, and state regulations. Um, the original plan for this property was to be attainable for people making 30 to 80% of the AMI. Um, but after listening to the community, the area median income range was increased to 30 to 120% AMI. This is important because 86% of Fruta households earn 120% AMI or less. And this future development will serve 
52% of the existing fruit of residents who are currently cost burdened by rental housing. Um, we also intend to record the site plan as shown in the PUD so that the city has assurances that we'll build what is we will build what is shown. Um, we're also requesting that subsequent applications are reviewed administratively. Most site plans in Fruta are administratively approved along with subdivision plats under 10, under 10 lots. So um, this will be three lots kind of divided um, by where the roads are. The original, um, sorry, additionally, uh, the developer is willing to um, enter into an agreement with the city to restrict the area median income range um, on this development. So there's a guarantee that future residents of the Fruit of Muse will not exceed 120% of the AMI. The architectural design for the Fruit of Muse will be a modern farmhouse vernacular that relates to the Muse definition. Each of the buildings will front a green space or a street and will include a covered porch that will provide a sense of arrival in place. The townhomes are two stories in the center and step down to one stories on each side, providing a variety of roof forms that break down the scale of the building and give each home and identity. The community building and amenities will also complement the overall style of the development and will become a hub of activity. The property will be professionally managed and well maintained. The site has several uh, sustainability features and amenities, including 10% of the parking stalls will be electric vehicle ready. Um, we talked about all the trails, tree lined streets, detached sidewalks, um, clubhouse play area, bike parking and maintenance area and community gardens. And in closing, um, we believe this development is in the public interest by providing much needed workforce housing for teachers, nurses, and firefighters, police officers, and other working people who have difficult time finding attainable housing in Fruta. This PUD amendment meets the city's approval criteria and furthers the vision set forth in the Fruta Comprehensive Plan. Thank you for your time and consideration of our request, and we look forward to answering your questions. We have the full design team here um, to answer any technical questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Kim. Uh, so with that, uh, now is the time when we're gonna open this up for public comment. And so because we've got, um, we do have some people online, correct, Shannon? So we're gonna alternate if there's public comment, uh, Shannon's gonna, every two or three, we'll probably have somebody from uh, uh, remotely uh, talking on this. So with that, we're gonna open this up for public comment. So is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? All right, if you can step up and uh, state your name and address for the record, and then uh, I'll let everybody know, make sure you talk into the mic because the people online can't hear well if uh, you're not speaking into the mic. John Rotwick, and uh, I live in the village of Country Creek here in Fruta. I've been a resident there for over 15 years. I'm a retired psychologist and also a former university dean and college vice president, active in AARP and also in the area agency on aging. Today, I received a very interesting email from the Colorado National Monument Association, and it just reads brief briefly, do you wanna help Colorado National Monument in a significant way? Do you have an extra room or know of an apartment or house for rent? Colorado National Monument is hiring seasonal and permanent employees, but these employees are having a hard time finding affordable place to live in the Grand Valley. Maybe you can help or know someone who can. This particular email is not terribly unusual. I have seen them before. I'm also aware that the hospitals, the educational uh, or school systems and other nonprofits in the area are also equally trying to find housing for their employees. As you know, the city of Fruta became part of the designated livable community initiative of AARP a few years ago. And as part of that initiative, the city has also agreed to at least begin to address any of the eight dimensions of livability. And one of those is affordable housing. 
And so I simply am going here tonight to reinforce and also to support the Fruit of Muse project because I believe that it is consistent with what the city is trying to accomplish. And I believe that the pr program that they are developing for this particular initiative certainly has merit. So thank you. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak on this item? All right. Please state your name and address for the record. I'm the aforementioned Phil Onofrio. I live at 2301 Grand Cash um, in the Redlands. Um, I helped uh, Kim find this property while I was busy trying to sell her some excess property that the school district had. She was not interested. Um, she loved this property the minute she saw it. Um, the school district, ironically, at its board meeting tonight has an agenda item to discuss uh, teacher housing. We're having a hard time. I'm retired now. So we were, when I was there, having a hard time finding uh, teachers. Part of the problem is low pay. Part of the problem is uh, housing. Um, we were recently able to increase our starting teacher pay to about 40,000 a year. So two teachers, um, could um, rent one of these uh, houses and still qualify for a subsidy. It's important that we find a way for our uh, teachers and our firefighters and others to be able to live in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Right, do you have somebody, anybody online that wants to speak? Um, seeing none right now, Mr. Mayor, but I would like to just remind everyone that is remoting into the uh, meeting virtually that if you would like to submit a public comment on this agenda item, all you need to do is raise your hand. And if you called in, you can dial star six and we will unmute you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Is there anybody else in the audience here that would like to speak? All right. If you please step up and state your name and address for the record. Hi, Council. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dave Krizny, 917 Squire Court. Um, I'll try to kind of do it this way. I mean, you guys have been chasing this shiny object for a while, which has started off as affordable housing and then attainable housing. And then you thought it was going to be through creating higher density, and then that really didn't do it. And you've, you've been pursuing a number of other, um, uh, you've been pursuing a number of ideas for uh, attainable housing. Um, that would um, create some opportunities for the workforce, the people who um, are making that 50,000 or below to be able to live in uh, work in Fruta. And uh, so this is one of those examples. Um, and it, there's, a, there's a book called Decisive and uh, it's by uh, Chip Heath. And they talk about the two P's of decision-making and one is, promotion and one is pessimism. And so in this one, there is a ton of promotion. Who wouldn't want this thing that can create uh, opportunities for people to live in Fruta, to, to be able to afford living in Fruta. Um, so the people who are promoting it are promoting that part of it. Um, but you're also talking about, um, this is a, a multi-million dollar um, project that is using tax credits that can guarantee that they will, uh, they can guarantee the quality of it for the next 15 years. And so there's this, this, this part of it that says, we're building this now and when it's done, it, it most likely will, will uh, provide the, the need for, this group of people who are who can't afford to move into Fruita now. We're talking about something that'll be here for the next 40 years. And they're talking about their investors will stay invested in it. And um, they will, uh, IndieBuild will stay involved with it for the next 15 years. Um, but you're making that decision now and it'll be here for the next 40 years. 
they also want to do this in a process where you look at it today and that's it. We're going to, we're going to have it as an administrative decision. So in part of this decision making process, it seems like it might be helpful to talk about what happens after 15 years. And they have this group of supporters right now, the school district, uh, Colorado Canyons, Family Health West, and talk about, so what does this look like in 15 years from now? And who owns it? Who manages it? If you're talking about a housing authority, this is a large project. And so this could easily take up your entire housing authority um, resources to do this. And so there's a the, thought there. I will. And so there's this promotion and there's this pessimism and then there's this resources. And so in thinking about any decision, if you could use that P and P and then what are your resources that make this happen? Um, it, certainly just looking at that promotion part, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to do this? But look at the long term for the, the kid who's going to live in this thing. They're all kids to me, but who's going to live in this thing in two years from now? Or the kids going to live in here from 20 years from now in a, in a facility that's 20 years old, needs a lot more maintenance, needs a lot more uh, management kinds of things. All right. Thank you, Dave. Is there anybody else in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? If you'd please step up and state your name and address for the record, please. All right, well, we won't. I got you, Tom. Oh, okay, good, I won't do it. <clears throat> Sorry, modification here. Okay, my name is Tom McNamara. My wife, Carrie, and I live at 1768 Waters Lane, Fruita, Colorado. We've been here for nearly 23 years. We moved here when Fruita was 6,800 in population. In 2019, the average home price in... Um, the Mesa County Valley was $277,000. That was two years ago. 2021, two years later, $427,000. There is perhaps 150 homes available. Most of them are in that same price bracket, which is according to Mesa County's statistics and and agreed upon by Pruda also, the medium a AMI or average monthly income is approximately 54,000, I'm sorry, $55,000 as of 2021. In 2019, it was 53,000. So we've had a $200,000 increase in home value and a $2,000 increase in income value on average in the home in Pruda. 1.2% of the homes available in Fruta today are available for rent. I'll repeat that. Of approximately 150 homes that are available, 1.2% are available for rent. I'll go back to my daughter who's paying $1,600 a month on a teacher's pay. She has to drive DoorDash in order to make ends meet. <clears throat> I guess it was with the support of Mesa, uh, Colorado Canyons Hospital with District 51, the Fruited Chamber of Commerce, they all realized that this huge gap exists between the affordable home and the unaffordable home. That gap has actually closed here in Fruita. There is no affordability. So I would urge you to strongly consider making this housing development as a stepping stone, perhaps, to future development in Fruta, that this is going to be, I think, a trend to make housing affordable for anyone in the workforce. We're not talking about Section 8 vouchers. We're not talking about, I will just leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about people in the workforce making between $50,000 and $90,000 a year so that they don't have to commute from Grand Junction to work here. They don't have to combine their incomes and live together as teachers. I heard you. 
All right. So I would urge you to support this project. Simply. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. Do we have anybody online that has raised their hand? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor. All right. We'll bring you back here. Is there anybody that? Um, all right, Lou, the guy right behind you had his hand up first, if you want. <clears throat> we'll get to you next, Lou. Michael Handley at 1646 Myers Lane in Brandon Estates. Uh, first, let me say we all recognize the need for affordable housing in Fruta. I very much support the direction that staff and council has taken toward um, the uh, down payment assessment program and uh, the, um, the direction we're taking for affordable housing. Very much support it. There is a need. We moved into our house in Brandon Estates uh, three years ago. Uh, when we moved and were looking in Fruta, I took a look at the zoning map to make sure that the area around Brandon Estates was zoned detached, single family, low density. This was important to me because the house we bought in, in Plano, Texas 40 years ago was on the edge of town. All of the uh, land around it was zoned low density residential. And it wasn't long, unfortunately, before variances were granted to allow high density apartment complexes and townhomes. Um, within five years of when we moved into our house in, in Plano, we had one high density complex and, and it was a very large complex. It brought traffic and congestion to the neighborhood. And since the uh, city council granted a variance for that project, they granted a project on the other side. And this was within four blocks on one side, five blocks on the other side. So we had a second high density uh, housing project, apartment complex. And then it wasn't long before we had a third high density project. And so we had a lot of congestion the city didn't go back and update their circulation plan for the streets. The streets were inadequate for all of that traffic load. And here we're looking at a project with a single access, um, K and four tenths, with a school, a lot of traffic. I walk my dog on that street every day, every morning, and I see the traffic during uh, school hours. And we have a, a project that will bring a lot of traffic through that school street, the single street out to 18 and a half road. And I think the road is, in, is inadequate for you know, that type of, of traffic and four tenths and even 18 and a half. So let me just uh, sum up and say, um, I would be very disappointed to see a high density project um, uh, approved in our neighborhood since we very intentionally chose a place to live in Fruta that was all zoned uh, low density. And I must say, um, the city took a lot of effort to update its master plan. And I, I have to ask, why did we go through that effort to uh, update the master plan if we're just going to then ignore it and allow high density uh, projects in residential areas uh, whenever they come along. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, Lou, did you wanna come up next? I'm Lou Mudd, I live at 126 South Maple Street. And I've been a Fruita resident for 16 years. Um, everything changes. You know, the, the, the amount of people that want to live here, um, the lack of housing, uh, the, the short-term rentals, all those kinds of things make housing uh, 
make it less available. Um, so this is one opportunity to help provide uh, some decent living conditions, a decent place to live for uh, 50 residents, 50 uh, different dwellings. I know it's a relatively high density for an area, um, but as I said, when I came up here is that things tend to change. And if we don't allow anything, uh, you know, housing for the people that want to live and work here, um, then they'll, in my opinion, they change for the worse. We would have trouble finding ways for people to live here. Um, people who wanted to live here wouldn't be able to afford it. So hopefully you'll uh, vote in favor of this uh, development because I think it's a good opportunity for uh, people who want to live and work here to be able to afford this. It would also give people the opportunity who aren't at the high income levels to put some money aside so they could afford a down payment on a house sometime down the road. So hopefully you'll uh, vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you, Lou. Is there anybody else online? None? All right. Is there anybody else in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? All right, come on up. State your name and address for the record, please. Jose Fernandez, 1745 and 3 Tenths Road. Uh, my daughter goes to that new elementary school. And uh, we line up about a half hour before school's out. And we're lined up already out to 18 and a half road. Okay, by the time four o'clock bell rings. Um, I understand the need. I'm all for it. The location, I just uh, disagree with it. Um, my background is, is I'm a plumber by trade. Uh, I, I worked with several different contractors here uh, during doing uh, dirt work, including for Monument Ridge Elementary and also across the street there for that development. Um, the need is there. Uh, I just don't believe that it's in a, the best location for it. Uh, I know that uh, a week or so ago, we kind of uh, took away the opportunity for something similar to this to be developed, uh, again, for the need. And I understand, you know, uh, where it was going to be located. Again, not a good location. Um, there's several ver uh, locations that uh, can be developed closer to uh, town, uh, but not in a one-way street uh, that's already densely populated uh, for us and for our children that go to school there. Um, the other thing is uh, we're not only introducing 50 more residents, we're introducing their families uh, that do not live here yet. Um, so uh, for most of us that go to city market, you know, I know uh, we all wish that that was bigger. <laughs> so we're introducing, uh, you know, 50 houses. Let's uh, give it, you know, two, three people per house, per townhome. Okay. Um, and then we're multiplying that with also the cars. I understand they have a plan for the cars, but there's going to be cars on that one single side road. I can already see it. As a father and as a resident for 10 years, uh, I moved here you know, for the purpose of being in the country. I love it. Um, like I said, I'm not poo-pooing the need for it, for the housing, uh, but um, just in the wrong place. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item? This will be your opportunity. Once we close public hearing or public, public comment, you won't be able to make any. Is there anybody online, Shannon? No? All right, this is the last opportunity. Is there anybody that'd like to speak on this item? 
All right, hearing none, I'm gonna close public comment and uh, bring it back to council. Um, I also wanted to open up that opportunity if there's anything uh, that staff wants to input. And we also have our city attorney here as well that can answer questions uh, on this item. Uh, so with that, uh, we appreciate all the public comment. Uh, we also have all the public comment that was written in our packet. Uh, so we've all had opportunity to look at that as well. So with that, I'm gonna bring it back to council. Uh, who would like to start or who has questions that would I can. Go, all right, Karen, go ahead. Um, well, I, uh, one uh, one thing I think we could address, and this might. Um, um, yeah, I was just getting ready. To our, say. Oh, that. Our, okay, that's what my. That's, I was. That's our, <laughs> my segue. Okay. Applicant gets an opportunity to. Um, to, to okay. All right. Yeah. That'd be good. Thank you for that reminder. All right. So Alicia or Kim, one of you two want to reply to the public comment? Sure. So I'm going to bring up several team members here to answer a variety of the things that we heard. But just to start, um, we heard that uh, there were concerns about this being a high density development. But according to the Fruta um, Use Comprehensive Plan, this area is designated as residential four to eight dwelling units per acre. And we're actually proposing seven dwelling units per acre, which is under that max density, but within that uh, recommended range for future land use for this area. And I would just want to confirm with Dan that that's correct. Thank you. Dan um, is shaking his head yes, just for the audience. We need, I mean, for those online, we need to make sure we're covering that. Shake louder, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to uh, go ahead and bring up um, Eric, um, our traffic engineer to kind of talk about the traffic report that we submitted and um, some of the concerns around traffic. And then um, after Eric, I'll bring up Kim um, to talk about what happens after that 15 years that um, in the light tech uh, process. Um, and I think that's that covers all the, the concerns. Thank you. Eric Marcus with Apex Consulting Engineers. We prepared the traffic study for the project. Um, quickly, there was just, I think, basically two comments. And one is that the K4 Street in front of the middle school um, is already over capacity and maxed out. And traffic circulation is poor. People are lining up to pick up their kids and drop them off. So first of all, the K4 Street is has it looks like about a 36 foot wide paved section. So that's literally three lanes of, of roadway. So it's not a one way road. There's a, enough room for um, two lanes and a center turn lane if you wanted to put that in to allow people to get in and out of the parking lot more easily. Um, additionally, when the, the, the school the, the way that we do traffic is that we analyze the peak one hour period in the morning and the peak one hour period in the evening because everybody's trying to get to and from work. That's, that's the way all traffic studies are prepared. And all of us have to do the traffic studies the same, by the way. So the peak hour periods are typically between seven and nine and from four to six in the evening. It turns out that the school doesn't start the, the start bell doesn't ring until nine o'clock and they actually have um, posted on their website that you're not allowed to drop your kids off any earlier than 835. So, so the school drop off basically is at the very tail end of the peak hour traffic for all of the commuters that are going to and from work. The peak hour traffic for, for 18 and a half road happens to be between um, eight and I'm sorry, seven and eight. I'm sorry, eight and nine. So again, we're just we're, we're just hitting the very tail end of that. So it it is making the peak hour a little bit heavier, but it's for for a very short period in that peak hour time. And then in the evening, the the bell rings at four o'clock. The peak hour traffic is actually between five and six. So commuters are going to miss that school traffic altogether. Having said that. The, the school has little impact to the average commuter. So in our traffic study, the other thing that we try to look at is um, 
just kind of an aggravation level. So if you're if you're at an intersection, you're trying to get in or out of that intersection, there's levels of service that we have to analyze. And we included that in the traffic study. And our traffic study is pretty conservative, meaning whenever there's an opportunity to choose a number between uh, a higher number and a lower number, we always pick the higher number. If there's an opportunity to, to make a decision on whether or not more traffic is going to be turning left versus right, left-hand turns are less safe. That's how they're, they're the most serious accident, accidents. So we, we actually try to make sure that we are trying to get an accurate count of those left hands, left hand turns. And if anything, we overestimate the number of left hand turns. Also take the longest. So when we're talking about level of service and safety, those left hand turns are important. The traffic study actually shows that currently there are left turn lanes that are required on, on several streets. Our recommendations said that we don't recommend installing them. So we look at traffic, not just from what's gonna happen from after the project is developed. We're required to project 20 years into the future. We have a metropolitan planning organization that gives us data that tell us what the future traffic volumes we can expect on each major roadway. 18 and a half road has a, has a growth rate of seven. That is unheard of. That's probably three times higher than average growth rate than we see on a street. Normally we would go back to the community that is requiring the traffic study and argue that, that that's excessive. It's probably incorrect. We're going to do our own analysis and try to reduce that. Because of the location of the school, we thought let's go ahead and use it and see what happens. It turns out that with, with all of the growth that is anticipated on the 20 year horizon, that the level of service at the most used intersection, which is gonna be right there at the school at K4 and 18 and a half road, still has a, a, a level of service where the average wait is going to be about 18 seconds. So westbound traffic, leaving the school, turning left at the, at the worst point in the time of day, because not only did we be conservative in our projections, we added that peak hour traffic to our peak hour traffic. So, so even though I told you at the very beginning that they that uh, at one period, they just barely overlap and at the other period, they're, they don't overlap at all, we combine those two worst case scenarios. We're looking at about a 17 second wait on average. I understand some people may have to wait a, a minute, minute and a half, but that means other people, there's like three or four call, cars that went maybe in about 20 seconds. So that those rates are averages. I'm not saying no one's gonna wait any longer than that, um, but we don't even consider to, that a intersection is failing until we get closer to the 60 second range. The, so, so we didn't think that it was necessary to add a left turn lane because there's so few cars turning to the north, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, additionally, when we widen the streets, it takes longer for pedestrians to cross the street. And we wanna reduce everybody's exposure time to traffic. And the best way to do that is to have a narrow street. So, so if you wanna keep that intersection safe for pedestrians, you're better off having that narrower street the traffic will still run at a safe and, and comfortable level for everybody. Do you have any questions? No, we'll come back to that. Okay. So thank you, Eric. I wanted to answer um, David's. Kim, if you could speak into the mic so the ones online can hear you. Okay. Um, I wanted to answer David. Prisney's question about what happens in year 15. And um, typically what happens in a year 15, um, a year which is actually pretty much year 17 from now, um, is the investor asked to be removed from the partnership. And typically the developer will just um, stay involved in the property and refinance it. Um, there are instances where the developer can offer a housing authority or a qualified nonprofit a right of first refusal and give them 
an option to buy the property for basically exit taxes, uh, a small amount of money, far less than market value, but um, that's a negotiated term. But typically, most of the uh, developers that I've ever worked with have always stayed inside the part, stayed with the property and just refinanced it. All right, thank you, Kim. Is there any anything else, Alicia? All right. All right, now with that, we're gonna bring it back to council. Okay, Karen, are you ready? Yeah, that, that was good, because I those are questions I was gonna ask. Um, I wanted to, it, Dan, if you could put that slide up that had the modifications, uh, it was one of your first ones. I just wanted to look at that again. Um, it would be modifications uh, to the PUD, the current PUD, I think. Oh, okay. So my question, could you just tell me what, um, like on number two, and it was about the circulation modifications, the, um, the fully platted ingress, egress points, I mean, what, could you explain to me what that what that means? So the, the purpose of, of that is that it's, uh, I, I mean, I completely hear what what Eric's saying uh, with Apex, but that is a that is a code requirement, not necessarily like a, a thing that can be validated or refuted as a part of a traffic study. That's just what we would require if there was uh, uh, a development that was proposed uh, that was above 25 units. So a great way to uh, kind of explain that is that I think a lot of people in this room are familiar with Oak Creek Estates, and it has an entrance that is at the farthest west point um, on KN four tenths, and then it has an exit onto 18 and a half road. And so those are those fully platted and dedicated rights of way that interact with two collector roads. Okay. And do you want to add? It's written a little off too, because once you get to 350, it's, it, it's the two fully platted um, access points. At the 250, it's either two fully platted access points or one access point and an emergency exit. And then if you get to 750, that's where you have to get the three access points. Oh, okay. So the fact that there are the, there are two, and is, is that our accommodation or is that a, an adjustment? That is an adjustment. Yeah. And, and, and that is, uh, it's also in there to get uh, kind of neighborhood to neighborhood circulation. So in, in Fruta, you'd see like a lot of, you know, suburban type of developments. Like we uh, either require a stub um, into what is maybe just vacant farmland at that time, but as it develops, it would provide circulation. A good example would be the, the street stub that's to the south on Brandon, on Brandon Drive. Okay. Um, and then I, in, in reading, and this, this question would probably go to Kim or your team, um, there was talk about the electric um, utilities and a concern about that. Um, is there a, a thought of any solar in the project? If you could talk about that. We went all electric and we would like to um, look into solar. Um, we're looking into, um, we have a, a environmental consultant called Group 14, who's very well respected in the state. Um, we are using high efficiency um, uh, HVAC system that is just above um, zero energy. Zero energy was just a little too expensive for us right now, but if we um, do move forward with solar, we'll definitely be reaching um, different green levels. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Let's see. I think, and and um, Lou addressed this. I mean, I think when I moved to Fruita, the the um, population was about forty five hundred, uh, and what a great place to be. You know, that's why we moved here. 
And uh, needless to say, there's been growth. It's all over. And, um, and people that move here are as excited as I was when I moved here. So I feel like the way we manage our community, the way we've planned, the way our community has responded, um, I think we want to be a welcoming community. We don't want to be entitled. We don't want to be an entitled community that turns away people that can't afford it. Maybe they can work here, but they can't afford to live here. Uh, for me, I think it's, it's about creating as many opportunities as we can um, and doing it in a way that's going to be a quality, you know, well-managed, uh, project. And I think we have a great staff. We have, um, you know, I, I just think our, I think our, the work we've done leading up to this will help us um, create those opportunities in a really positive way and uh, get our, get our community members to um, kind of wrap themselves around it. It's really sad to think Teachers makes so little money and can't live here. Like Tom Max, I mean, I, it just, it's heartbreaking. Um, sorry. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I addressed everything that I wanted to. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Karen. Who wants to go next? You want me to go around? Matthew? So doing the math, um, to your point, we're looking at about 6.5 units per acre. My math is correct on that. Uh, looking at the elevations, what are the heights of those townhomes? The heights of the townhomes are 26 feet, 8 inches from base to the top of the peak of the roof. Okay. okay. I'm easy tonight. Those were my only two questions. That was it? I'm not feeling great. Well, we can always come back to you. So, oh, can can he made me? I had one more thing. Yep. I'm Go sorry. ahead, Karen. It, it goes to what you were you were just saying, Matthew. So, um, Michael, I know um, it, where you live in Brandon Estates, and when I drove out there to, you know, check out where everything was, um, where the project would be, there's there's so much space between that project and where Brandon Estates is. And I, I just felt like that was sort of a, a non-issue at this point in time. So I, that's, that was the other piece I wanted to add. All right, Kyle, did you wanna go? Sure. Uh, just a couple things. One was, uh, I think in the, in the packet I read, that there are MOUs with D51 and, and maybe Family Health West. And so I kind of wanted to just kind of see, I guess, um, how that plays out le like legally. How do we ensure that we're serving the people that, that need the housing? And then also um, I, the, the range of 30 to 120% of AMI um, just with that large range, I mean, 30% of AMI is about, you know, 16.5 a year, um, which would be if you're if you're looking at what what is cost burdened, um, that'd be like 412 bucks a month rent. And so I was curious if that if I'm understanding that correctly, and like if we have um, numbers of units that might be fall into those percentages, or if that's stuff that's still to be determined and and um, with the PUD on our, our end, um, how do we ensure that those things are followed through on le legally? Okay, thanks. I heard a question about fair housing and um, a question about our AMIs and our unit mix. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Um, I have our attorney on the line if I screw this up, but um, we have affirmative marketing MOUs with the D51 school district and Family Health West. Mm 
D51 school district is the largest employer in Mesa County and Family Health West, as you probably know, is the largest employer in Fruta. And so we don't have a teacher and a nurse preference, right? That's what people like to say, but we don't have that. We have an affirmative marketing program with both the two largest employers in the city and the county, respectively, to um, share our vacancies with them or just marketing information so that they, they're aware of what's going on at the property. So that's pretty safe in a fair housing world. Um, it's fair housing is really interesting to me because artists are um, a special class. And apparently um, someone told me recently that bloggers, you can, they can, they have a special class for them, but teachers and nurses don't. So that is the answer to your first question. Does that work for you? Kind of. Okay. So it's just marketing. It's just yeah, it's just marketing. You have a way of marketing to those audiences. Yeah, like our our, our organization is going to talk to their organization and 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 so that they'll know what units are kind of what you know what's available. And honestly, that's that's kind of what any organization that's that big should be doing. You know, they should be reaching out to the affordable housing providers and having that level of communication and honestly in most properties they do but this is a way to sort of just make it more packageable like if you hire new employees in hr and they're like oh we have an mou with the fruit of muse we should check in and see if they have any units just very loose um and uh it typically works that way without an mou to be honest with you are you good well i'm just i guess i'm wondering how do we ensure that I guess maybe you're getting to the next part, which is if there's this huge range of AMI from 30% to 120%, what do those, you know, if there's 50 units, are there five units? Are there 10 units that are at 30%? Are there, you know, 49 of them are at 120%? Um, we're still figuring that out, but I can tell you roughly where they're at. A lot of them are in the center. A lot of them are at 60%, like literally more than I want to be um, because of the way the financing works. There's probably, I think there's 24 at 60% of very immediate income, which is different for one, two, and a three bedroom unit. So I don't have those answers with me, but there's a, a tiny little smattering at 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then the rest will, um, depending upon what the state agency requires, um, there's roughly six that can go up to 120% of very immediate income, which is more than the bottom half. The top half is kind of heavy, but um, it's a balancing act. So it may change. Can I piggyback on your question? What happens if somebody goes above 120% AMI? Uh, I don't, I think that we would probably, so we're not, <laughs> we are, um, voluntarily enforcing 120% at this point. I assumed one of my funders would require us to do 120%. And right now the city would be maybe the most stringent that is to be determined by the department, the state department of housing. So, um, so it's very somebody loose. Somebody gets a raise and goes above 120. Yeah. So they might rely on um, the compliance that we have for those other units, which is tax credit compliance it's um it's a whole set of rules that are different than what those 120s would be rele relegated to so i don't have the answer yet because we don't have the answer yet i would imagine it would be something similar to you can just keep going up until you reach a certain like 140 percent and I'm, I'm i don't know the answer i think probably your other question Kyle, is probably for mary elizabeth and how does the city you know yeah, and I mean, if, you know, we're deciding one way or the other on this, and our goal is to achieve something, and and it, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, matches up, and I'm just wondering, how do we, how does that work? I mean, what what's reasonable of our expectations right now um, in this process? Oh, sorry. Uh, couple of things. One, um, you know, don't lose sight of the fact this is a PUD major amendment that's in front of you. I just want to circle back to that's the application that's pending in front of you. Um, and the affordable housing piece, as Karen was talking about, um, does then have some adjustments that are allowed um, because of that. But 
then as far as the housing, affordable housing goes, I mean, there are a couple of different things that the city could do as part of the approval. Um, I did hear applicant offer to, you know, record the site plan as presented tonight. So you know that that's what's going to be happening. You're going to have, you know, where everything's located. Um, you know, that, that you can require the applicant to enter into an agreement with the city about AMI um, and that range and how to enforce it. I know there's some things going on. You know, we have, the city has not received a copy of the application to Chaffa. So we don't have that information as to exactly what's been presented or asked for as far as funding goes and makeup of units and how that's all gonna work out. Um, so you're gonna have this push and pull between what the applicant can do or you know, has the funding and ability to do you know, for, the pro for the project. And so uh, I, you know, I would just suggest if that is a concern of yours that we can write into the ordinance a condition that the applicant has to enter into an agreement with the city regarding AMI and the rentals of the units. Um, and then I don't know that we can totally dictate uh, how many units are going to be at 30, you know, that sort of thing, but at least to keep it in that range if that's what the council is interested in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, is, is, would you say that this is typical of just how the timing on projects like this works? I mean, this is the first time in my eight years that we've seen this type of project, and I think it's amazing. I, I'm all for, you know, affordable and attainable housing. Um, and I just, there's so many unknowns, you know, being the first time that we've gone through this process that I want to make sure that we're, we're looking at the different angles and. Um, so I think you're asking all the, all the right questions and, uh, you know, each one, just like any other application, all applications are different. So you have this one tonight, um, you're probably going to see other ones in the future that are, might be speaking the same funding type of sources, but are a totally different animal. Right. Uh, so. But the, I mean, I guess those would be my two, you know, two suggestions to add as conditions, um, and also, you know, that all the applicants' written and verbal representations that are part of the record be made, you know, conditions of approval. Matthew, did you have a question? And then I want to forget about Ken too. I, if Ken has a question, he needs to speak up. You're good for now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and chime in. Um, I, I know parking was a big deal with the uh, planning commission and uh, with, with people um, who written comments. And I, I also feel like uh, one and a half parking spaces per residence seems a little short. And I imagine you're gonna end up with a bunch of cars parked somewhere that is, is not, uh, not ideal for nearby residents, people attending, trying to get their kids to school. Um, is there any reason it looks by the rendering of the, the plot, it looks like there's quite a bit of space there. Is there any reason why you wouldn't consider adding at least a couple parking spaces per residence? That's a great question. So um, in affordable housing developments, we typically see even in communities like Fruta, that the typical ratio is 0.85 parking spaces per unit for projects between 30 and 80% AMI. Once we get to the 80 to 120% range, that typically parks at market rate. So in this case, we're, um, we're providing 75 parking spaces total. If we were to have six units that were between that 80 to 120% AMI and assume two parking spaces per unit, that's 12 plus one per the rest. And that would bring us to 72 parking spaces, which is still below uh, the 75 that we're providing. So we feel really comfortable um, with the parking ratio that's proposed. We've done this a lot at ShopWorks um, and we've done several parking studies as well. And a lot of that has to be driven by uh, the demographic, right? So we can anticipate that um, people within that range, um, especially the 30 to 80% AMI range will have one, one vehicle. Um, and then typically people can afford more than one vehicle uh, at that 80% range and higher. And so we would park that at a higher rate. Does that help answer the question? 
yeah that helps it's real narrow margin but it, yeah um um trying to think if I have any other questions it seems like everybody else has asked the questions I had we can come back to you if you have more yeah if I think know. of any other time back Ken thanks all right thanks Ken Heather um I I'm also very excited about the we've been talking about doing something like this ever since I came on council so it's it's exciting to be doing this so so please don't hear my questions as like poo-pooing it I'm excited but I but I also want to be really conscious of all of the details um to, if I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned about just the the one way in I mean I don't, I'm learning a lot. I don't know everything about it, but it, it seems, it makes me a little nervous to just have the one entrance into it. And, you know, presumably the stuff around it's gonna get developed and there might be other streets that, you know, could hook in later, but I guess I'm, I, does, that, does that give you any concern, Dan, Sam, at all? I mean, you, you've recommended approval, so maybe I'm not asking, I'm asking a silly question. Well, I mean, that was part of the reason why we put it in the request for uh, uh, for adjustments is that we uh, typically, you know, look at these uh, applications and marry them up to the code. Right. And that doesn't meet the code. You know, we would typically have and have have uh, have placed conditions in an administrative space and also through the public hearing process as a part of a staff recommendation that that those are met. So, you know, part of our analysis is certainly, you know, the fact that like, this is not your traditional kind of free market type of development. And, you know, we were under the understanding the whole time that, you know, in order to hit those AMIs, you know, to serve our community in the most meaningful way, that there were going to likely be requests to modify those. Uh, we certainly share in the opinion that that uh, other acreage is, you know, likely to develop. You can just look no farther than, you know, a quarter to half mile radius and have seen, you know, uh, a, a lot of development pressure in that area. But it doesn't go without uh, noticing that, you know, that is that is something that we have held virtually everybody else to, um, whether it's the, you know, two fully constructed um, access locations or at least the emergency access. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I think I think you can argue that both ways where, you know, typically we would uh, obtain that access. Um, however, this is very likely to develop out and to force that location right now might restrict how the rest of that property develops. And so it's kind of a toss up whether um, whether that would be something that you'd want to require at this point. Because right, I would assume it's keeping your costs down, making it more manageable for you. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, Steven Swindell, Vortex Engineering. There's definitely one component. It, it's a tricky situation to use this piece and then as part of the land purchase have to go buy another easement further south or there's not really any other good connections mm -hmm. without buying some strange piece and orphaning another piece. like in this particular configuration is very difficult. But I had a question for Sam is given the proximity of the school and that touches multiple locations on 18 and a half, would that be, would you entertain that as an emergency access just in terms of practicality? Where are you suggesting that emergency is? In terms of if there was a, a block, you're saying we need one plus a second at, put an emergency access. Of the would you consider that the school parking facilities themselves would serve as an emergency access off the property? It's kind of separate, but it's separate. But I'm just trying to to, to marry up with the requirements and, and envision what the code wants. Right. It's it's still only one access, right? So what about, I mean, the north, you know, north of the property? I mean, it's, well, I mean, it's just fence, like where the, uh, and then there's the, the ditch. It, there's, it's, it's other owners. It's, it's not this owner. Right, right. Or at the school district, 
where the school is, where the playground is. There's no, I mean, no, I think we're talking about a paved surface where you would have a way out mm -hmm. secondary to what K.4 is. Not trying, to, not trying to travel over, you know. No, I, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there, there is, I mean, there is property there. If to put, yeah, if if we were to, yeah, use part of that, like the north end of the playground that would connect with their north end of their open space. It would probably make more sense to just do it on the existing property and not on the school property. But there's not a way to do that. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a configuration problem the, with the way that property is shaped in this particular parcel. Yeah. How do you can I can I ask a quick question then? Because I know you're saying how it's configured, but it hasn't been officially platted, correct? Correct. So there still is room for negotiation for whether that would be another street right next to the street that's going into the school, because there is property available. I'm just saying because right now this 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 isn't platted as far as this specific subdivision, and that we're waiting till this is approved um, to do that. So the question is, are the burn heides available to give extra access for a second access point? That would be my question. I, I think that one of the concerns that we have um, is, you know, we we develop this internal circulation, and it does meet fires requirements and engineering and all that. Um, and then this kind of nuance in the code of having it to connect to another public street, um, that's a huge, that's a huge additional cost. So while we could probably do it, we may not be able to do 10 buildings. We may not be able to deliver the number of units um, because it's one pool of money. We have to do everything to try and make it fit. And so um, we're trying to max out how many units we can get in there. Um, and we think we do have safe circulation within the site and access to K4 um, and Fort Dents Road. Um, but, you know, I wonder, um, and I don't know uh, if the city would consider even like accepting the internal ro roads as right of way. Would that yeah. count? Yeah, they are. These are all internal. All internal is public. That's correct. Is all public. The practicalities of the matter are that the site to the south, if we were to acquire additional right of way, would then burden that's that that portion forever, which where with where that right of way was acquired, and and that's there'd be no changing that 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 person's land subdivision could be then hampered by. But yeah, by that there's still we have that one plan, and that's a that's a tough ask, is to come buy a piece of property, and by the way. In order for me to buy this junk, I have to also split your remaining in half and impact your future plans. All right, and that's kind of what I was assuming, but I just want to make sure I was understanding everything. Um, I thought I had another question. I think my other question really is for the staff. You, you gave us five different options to consider. Oh. Hang on. You're good. You're good. I, I, I want to make sure that I'm you gave us five different options to consider. And I'm and I'm wanting to okay, Dan. Someone gave us five. And I'm just wanting to make sure that I understand each of them. Did you want to throw that PowerPoint back up on the screen? Yeah, just give me give me one second. Because this is the first step, right? And then it is. Yeah. And so this, so if if we wanted to have them enter into agreement about the AMI, we would do that tonight. No, that would be um, in the ordinance that that's something they would have to do before. <clears throat> let's we could make a deadline before issuing a building permit or a development permit. That agreement would have to be in place. Does that make sense? I think so. So that's not in your options right now because okay. it's something that just came about as you guys were talking. Well, my question is if we approve number two, which said that it would all be reviewed and approved administratively, would that preclude us being able to have that agreement later? No, because that's just talking about the uh, subdivision plat. 
okay. site plan. Okay, so so one of them is it's going to go through administratively. The other is there's still going to be a public hearing. The others that we defer, and the others are denied. What what's the difference between the first one, and the third one? So the July first, you know, Councilmember O'Brien and and members of Council. Uh, the the purpose of the five is to really in, in no other way just make sure that the expectations that you have of the staff are clearly articulated, you know. So we carry out whatever the motion is, you know, and whatever that whatever's voted upon. So we're just trying to come up with kind of the different paths that it could potentially take, and uh, and make sure that those were in front of the council. So we carried out the. The wishes of the council the best i way. got that i just don't understand what they're saying <laughs> so if like so for example the effective date would essentially be like if you want any more information or you just wanted to go through the public hearing process i view those two different motions separately do you understand what i'm saying i understand the difference between number two and number three i don't understand why number one is up there because it seems like the first one is the same as the third one it just doesn't well, there's, there's, there's no saying that they're going to be able to, to, to perform between now, February 1st and July 1st, and get all of those things done. Okay. No, number three would mean that the ordinance doesn't go into effect until July 1, meaning they can't come in for site plan or um, subdivision until after July 1. Number one would have the ordinance go into effect you know, in 30 days. Okay. Uh, and then they could submit. Does that make sense? So I yes, think that was the piece I was missing. Okay. And so I think some of the thinking behind that was, um, you know, to, to have a definitive answer about the chaff of funding. Okay. For number three. Correct. Okay. So we would know by then whether they got all the funding that they wanted. Correct. And I guess one thing, um, number three, I guess you could also have number 3.5, <laughs> which would um, have the ordinance being in effect July, 20, July 1 with administrative approval. So number three right now is written as public hearing right. approval, but right. you could write, uh, write that as administrative. Right, okay. That would be, I guess, 3.5. Is the intent of the third one to approve the PUD, but restrict its implementation until July 1? That's correct. So it would be, it would be approved, but we couldn't, couldn't start could digging holes. Well, you couldn't come in for subdivision or site plan until after July 1. Questions related to it. You, yeah, or you go ahead and answer. What well, do you want to ask? I think there's there's some problems with the chaffa process, which is why we're asking for that to be approved administratively. Is is we can't go through the process that we're in right now doesn't allow delays, and and we need definitive answers. I mean that that's the if if the definitive answer is well, to, you would have your you would have your zoning. You just would not be able to do anything until after July one. Would that preclude us from? submitting a plan for review or plans for review ahead of July 1 or could we would it just be would it be so effective the zoning goes in effect July 1 so July 1 would be an, a start date for construction uh, uh, Sam I don't know is that no no hold on I'm, I'm having a like so I, I suppose I maybe I'm a little maybe I'm a little confused so you know I heard that that uh you know what happens after 15 years but it's really 17 years which in my mind is thinking that it's not going to go to construction immediately so is that a fair statement so why is it why is it 17 but we haven't begun the because of the way the process works we're not in design on the on our part you know so there's design still left to happen and then your approval process we have still have to go through all of your process and then construction starts immediately thereafter <laughs> uh -huh. 
<laughs> Hello, good evening. My name is Sam Betters and I'm with Indy Build. I live at 4275 Terry Hall Court in Loveland, Colorado. The, the purpose and the reason that we're requesting this, you know, that we've really asked for some fast tracking on this project is because our application went into Chaffa today. The, um, our application went in with probably 35 other applications. My guess is that they'll fund probably 11 of those applications. So it's a very, very competitive process. And one of the, one of the things that they look at these things on is, and how they judge the process is not only on the quality of the project that's being presented, but on the community itself. And is the community accepting of the project? And is the project have readiness to proceed? And so if we can't demonstrate our ability to be able to start working on this project in a timely fashion, then we're gonna have, we're gonna have trouble competing. And that's what our concern is. Sam, let me ask you this then, when do they award the applicants? Yeah, the credits will be awarded probably by May 15th. Okay. Yep. What and happens if you don't get, I mean, you got a 33% chance. What happens if right. you don't hit it? Um, either withdraw the project or you come back for a second, uh, a, second, a second chance at it. We were actually gonna submit for this project back in uh, the fall of 2020, uh, 2021, excuse me. But we weren't ready. We weren't, you know, we didn't have the, um, the engineering done that we wanted to. We didn't think that the project would compete very well at that time. And so we, we withdrew the application because we weren't ready. We feel we are ready right now. We feel the, the application is really primed. We think that, the, uh, that we'll compete well if we can get your approval tonight. If we can't get your approval tonight, it's not gonna go well. All right, well, I'll tie in with what Matthew was saying that if it's not approved, because if we're approving a PUD right here tonight. So if we look at a PUD, we're approving the 50 units on that acreage. And so if we're voting on that pending that they get financing, that PUD will still be active. Is that correct in that statement? That So if we approve the PUD, even if they don't get financing, they could still develop it. Um, but we wouldn't have control, I don't think, over what the housing or the rental or anything would be. Because we're approving, we're approving the land use code. We're not approving that they're getting financing or anything like that. Is that accurate? That's accurate, Mayor. The only thing I would say is if you make a condition of the zoning that they enter in an agreement with the city you know, prior to development permit, that they will restrict the rental amounts to 30 to 100%, 120%, excuse me, of AMI, then whether they get the funding or not, they are still obligated to provide those units at that price range. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Just one more thing um, that was left out. So in the time frame, once once credits are awarded, our design team has 18 months to get a building permit. <laughs> So it's off to the races. It's like site development plan, subdivision plat, or you know, design development drawings or construction document drawings um, to get a permit to get it into the ground and and get a permit. Um, so they're very motivated. Chaffa is very motivated to make sure that people are following through on their investment. That something's being built in under two years. So um, it is that time crunch is really critical um, for the design team. To move quickly once those credits are awarded. Okay, um, I have a couple other questions regarding this. So, are you guys looking at anything uh, requiring that uh, the people that you rent to work in Fruta? Is that one of the requirements you guys are putting on it? If you want to step up the mic, please, Kim, just so everybody online can. Require that we. Uh, I did a um, development in Aspen years ago, they have a really, really, really uh, lengthy employee housing program that they wanted us to uh, overlay and you just can't do it. It's not fair housing. Okay. Um, the other question I have for you is, um, I know we're talking about a 15 year timeline um, and you said that uh, there's different buying options to buy out that because it's, it's gotta be active for 40 years. Um, my one question is, 
and again, this is just speculation is if nobody wants to do it, I know we're setting up a housing authority, but that doesn't mean the city's going to necessarily want to take on that risk. What if there isn't anybody to buy out that project? Does the developers developer... want to keep their projects? Just that's what I was trying to say to you before. I'm sorry if it wasn't, um, if it was confusing. Developers um, will give uh, a qualified nonprofit or a housing authority a right of first refusal as a negotiating tool. But most developers that I've worked with in 25 years keep their properties and refinance them. They're worth money to them. Okay. Um, the other question I have, I guess it will be relating to the, I mean, depending on what we as council, you know, want. Can I just back up one more yep. second? So typically sometimes those refinancings require, just you just go back and get more, credits that's that's a that's a typical refinance so there's another capital infusion into the property to rehabilitate it okay yeah it's well capitalized so developers typically wouldn't have any problem keeping that property um giving the right of first refusal to a qualified nonprofit and a or a housing authority is usually a, a negotiation like just part of a business deal or like a service provider, for example, like I've done worked on properties where a service provider um, donates their staff for 15 years and in return for that they get a right of first refusal to buy the property for exit taxes it's a tax number. Okay, well that answered my question. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike has one. All right. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of council. So Mike Bennett, city manager for those in the audience or online who may not know. I, I just have a few questions that I'd love to ask of both uh, the applicant um, and our city attorney, just to make sure we have some clarification. So first, uh, just wanted to make a couple of comments. First, I think no doubt uh, to anybody that the city's committed and has long-term goals for addressing the housing needs that we have and, and you are taking a, a great lead uh, even throughout the state on a number of strategies to address those so um, just want to make sure that anybody uh, paying attention is 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 aware that there are a number of strategies being worked on uh, to address the need and there's no doubt that there's a need in the community for of a gap of of workers pay and and housing um, related to uh, the project tonight um, I want to make sure just from from past policy decisions that the council has made, I uh, just want to make sure that you are comfortable or aware or if you have further questions about the exceptions that are being asked, one being because I've been here seven and a half years and we haven't made those exceptions that I'm aware of. So um, I think there are uh, there, there's some there's some merit that's been discussed based on the you know trying to make trying to get this project to work so that it can address. Uh, certain levels of income, but just keeping in mind, I want to make sure you all, uh, so that's no no surprise to you later, because there's been discussions in the past when those policies have been discussed of, you know, when there's 25 or more units having having two entryways, and when there's um, 10 or more units requiring more than administrative, even though we've recommended administrative reviews, um, you've kept it at 10 units uh, or uh, or less in the past. Um, with that in mind, and, and, and considering the fact that if, if you zone this property with those exceptions, based on uh, the requirements for attainable or affordable housing as being proposed, um, I, you know, the questions that were asked, are, I think, are, are, are good questions if, if, there's, if there's not CHAFA funding, correct? If, the, if, if they are not successful in receiving that that funding or some other means of funding to do the the project, those entitlements are are still there, um, as was mentioned earlier. So, want to make sure you're considering that and thinking through that. And if you have any questions, we can address uh, address that. But I do I do have a few questions uh, related to the application um, that was mentioned today. That's that was due today, um, and I think I think. The one question, if if not funded, uh, was already asked, uh, and uh, so I want to make sure that uh, if there's anything from our city attorney that and we can come back to this, if not funded, you know, if if we create the agreement that was mentioned by Mary Elizabeth, what other assurances are we are we looking to have to make sure that 
you know, this isn't exceptions for affordable housing project, but then it turns into a different type of project if, if not funded. The second question I have, or the, the main question I, I have is um, what, in addition to what, what happens to the entitlements if awarded and how do we, how does the city assure that they're tied to housing? I'm curious from the developer, uh, it's, it's mentioned that the application was today, um, the Chaffa looks at the, the type of project and the, um, the quality of the project and the city's support. And so my understanding is that the applicant has the city's uh, future housing authority or, or the city as a special limited partner. And so I just wanna, I want uh, to hear from the applicant on what does that assume or require of the, if anything, of the Fruta Housing Authority in the future? Um, and what if is needed or, or planned to be asked of the city from a financial commitment in the future or, or tonight if, uh, if they are to receive Chaffa funding as well. So I'd be curious to hear that addressed. I'm gonna kind of talk about the first half of your statements and then I'll bring Sam up for the second half. Um, so you're right, if this, um, if you approve this PUD, you're also gonna be approving the site plan as designed, <laughs> as drawn that's in the PUD. So if this uh, project isn't funded, um, whoever, you know, if we don't get a second crack at this, someone's gonna to have to build this <laughs> or they're gonna to have to come in and try and amend it the PUD and go through that whole public process, right? In which the conditions would change based on uh, whoever's on council at that time. Um, the second part is the affordability agreement. Is that correct, Dan? Would do you not agree with that? Sorry. Like if if they if the if this project is not awarded tax credits that um, and the zoning was approved as shown, that this would be, this site plan would run with the land, essentially, well, with the zoning, sorry, with the zoning, and someone would have to come through the public process to amend it, right. Dan, can you speak into the mic so we've got it on record, please? That, that's correct. I was just curious when you were talking about the separate agreement, you know, like that kind of lives outside of the, of the right. zoning ordinance. That's not baked into that. So. That's correct. So, um, so that's, that's the downside, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're being, we're here today being hopeful, um, that, you know, we get some good lunar new year, <laughs> you know, fortune and, um, and that this project will be awarded Chaffa credits. Um, but in the event that it's not funded and we don't get to go to another round, the next applicant will have to go before you to try and amend this or build it as is, um, as drawn. So um, that's kind of the options. And if it is approved um, and you want a condition of affordability, um, given that this project is awarded credits, I think the applicant is more than willing to do that. So that's our guarantee of if Chaffa decides to select this project, we will enter into an agreement with the city to make sure that the rents are between 30 and 120% AMI for the length of, you know, however long the Chaffa loan is. Um, and, and Alicia, the, just if I may real quick, not necessarily for the, uh, for the council's deliberation, I think that the purpose of the options available to council is that the, the modifications or adjustments that are in the staff report were arrived at that conclusion because of the affordability. That's right. So without the affordability, you know, we would have not looked at those the same way. And so I think that's part of the reason why we are, you know, recommending approval from the staff's perspective and why we listed those options is that we'd like to marry those options, you know, to the, the affordability, not just have a site plan that has one access that then becomes a free market development. That's right. We agree with, we agree with that. And then, um, and then to answer the second half of your questions, I'll bring Sam back up. Mike, I'm gonna answer the question about the uh, SLP, I think. Sam, could you speak into the mic, please? 
Oh, I, I thought I was. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Just so we can, I, we can yes. hear, everybody can hear. I apologize, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Mr. Bennett asked a question about uh, an SLP, which is a special limited partner. And what was proposed or what, was, what we'd like to contemplate is at some point, once you create your housing authority, that we uh, enter into a special limited partnership agreement with that housing authority. Um, that provides some special advantages to both the project and, and to, to us as a developer, uh, frankly. Uh, it also provides an opportunity for you as a community to control the development and, and to have a, a say in how that development is run. And we think that's extremely important. I should probably back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, before I agreed to participate with Kim on this project, uh, up until 2018, um, I was the executive director of the Loveland Housing Authority. Um, I had that position for 37 years. And so during that time, I had the opportunity to do a number of these developments. And I had the opportunity to do developments both as a housing authority independently and along with a private developer. And so there are advantages for both the private developer and the housing authority to enter into these kind of partnerships. The expectation of the special limited partner is, is something that's negotiated. It could be very simply as you're a silent partner, you're there for tax purposes. And um, if you wanna have anything more to say, then let's, let's talk about that in the partnership agreement at the beginning. Or it could be as much as we want to be involved in, in starting to understand how the, how the management of the project works and eventually take over the management of the project. And we may eventually want to be the owners of the project. All those are negotiated points. If I'm the housing authority, I eventually want to own the project because I think that's an, an important community asset. And that's one of the things that we'd like to offer as part of the project. I don't know if I answered your question. No, thank you. And, and just to just to have a follow up question to that, Sam, does because as you mentioned, we don't have a housing authority up and running yet, and so we're not able to you know get to that point yet. Um, does the app? I guess my question, just to clarify, does it does the application assume that? So would is Chaffa basing any of their decision making on the on the credits or the financing? that that's assumed that that will for sure be the case, that the housing authority will be an SLP? That's a good question. Uh, the most important question for Chaffa is, does the Chaffa, does, does the project perform? And does it, does it pencil out? And so one of the things that they'll ask us is, if the housing authority is not a special limited partner, because one of the things you get at, as by admitting the partner, uh, by admitting the housing authority into the partnership, is you get to remove the property from property tax rolls. And so then Chaffa will ask us, if the, if the housing authority isn't a member of that partnership, then how do you expect to, take, to pay the property taxes? And we have to demonstrate to them how we've modeled that as well. And so that's, that's, that's how we'll answer that question. Matthew? So is there an expectation within this application that our housing authority, which we don't even have bylaws, Right. Will eventually enter into an agreement. There's not an expectation. There's a hope, but there. But if you decide that you don't want to be a part of that, we can still do the project without. It. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Sounds like where we are all are is you want to do something. We want you to do what. But but we're so like you got a bunch of lay people up here. We don't. Well, some of us know quite a few. I don't. You know. I teach English. I teach poetry, but. But we also just have this like baby housing authority and we're hardly trying to wrap our brains around what this housing authority even means. And so, although I'm really passionate about this subject, I just want to make sure, you know, that I'm doing my due diligence for, for the entire community. So I, I do, I, it felt like a minute ago, we all were nodding our heads that if we could amend our doohickey thing up here, that's a technical term, doohickey, um, to it. I don't know how you said it, Mary Elizabeth. To have to enter in an agreement about the AMI, that stuff, you, the lawyer language. Right. It, you guys were nodding your heads, and we were nodding our heads, and then we yeah. think we can make that a go. 
Yeah, I think, well, I think there's a couple questions in here I, I want to address based on this. So I know the July 1, um, I, I would be okay with saying, let's say May 15th, because I think that gives us a little more um, insight. I also think we should have not an administrative review, but come back to council. That would be my only other. The public public process. Right, a public process. If I can, if I can Mr. Mayor. Yes. That's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, because that that is that is going to be a um, a problem for us with competing with the other applications. Which and which part having come not having an administrative review or having a date having, on there having additional public review. Because okay, why would that be an issue then? I guess it would be my question. Well, when they make the uh, when they make the award of the credits, they want to know that the that the project is now within your control as the developer, and that you're not going to be subject to additional. A public review and that all you have to do is comply now with the city codes that you know you've got some planning guidelines that you have to it, it, it administer and, and agree to and if you and if you hit those targets then you'll get your building permit but if there is if there is a uh, any doubt that we have an issue about being able to accomplish that about getting our building permits then they're going to pass on our project isn't that what we've done tonight I mean, haven't we had a public? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what would be I'm, different I'm not for sure you on May 15th than tonight. To do this again, I mean, no, I'm I, just trying I don't to know what to do it again. You know, um, my thing was looking at, you know, the, the process of it. And let me ask Dan that question then, as far as why would this be different than what we normally would do? Or would we not well, only have administrative review? Because that was one of the things you said with the two points were the access point, not having two was a thing. And then also having an administrative review was a differentiating thing from what we'd normally do in the past. Correct. For the like the zoning would happen, but like the applicants have requested that the the site plan, which is the final engineering, which has I think is underway, but has not yet been fully completed and any of the landscape plans and all the things that are traditional with a site plan that would be done administratively. And then at that final subdivision plat that legally separates this part or this perspective kind of area that is uh, an exhibit or is exhibit A, I believe, uh, in, the, in the staff report that that would authorize the staff to process that subdivision plat, which is, which is typical in the sense that the number of lots that they're proposing to uh, um, uh, to legally subdivide, but planned unit developments, we typically would go uh, the full distance and we would have multiple public hearings similar to the applications that we've seen recently that have been requesting a PUD zoning. Okay, because I mean, that's just my caution to council that if we approve this one to go to administrative, the next PUD that comes before us can use this as their platform to say, hey, you've approved it in the past, so why won't you approve ours? And so that's I something we so. have to be aware of as a council that if we're making this exemption, we're setting precedent. We're setting precedent. Is that correct, Mary Elizabeth? Every land use application is different. So somebody may come in and argue that, but you have no obligation to, to do it the next time just because you did it when the, in this instance. Because I, I mean, I would argue that the reason that we're making these concessions is because this project is so unique. And so if well, and as Dan said earlier, I mean, the reason these adjustments are even be, were even considered by staff is because of the affordable housing component. Right. Otherwise, you would be requiring, you know, two parking spots per unit, two entrances and public review. Right. And so those are three items are the three items that are not, you know, you are having fewer parking spots, one entrance, no public review because of the affordable housing component. But still more parking spots than are typically required. I mean, but for that. There's a need. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, there, there's a need in that, uh, you know, it, everybody can only talk about parking and like what typically happens because you never know about a development until it actually occurs right how many people actually end up with cars there etc i mean this development's 1.5 miles from the grocery store so you know i think that's something just to consider about whether folks will have cars 
So I guess back to your concern of a setting precedent, if Mary Elizabeth says every, every one that comes before us is unique and we make a decision, and our decisions tonight are based on the unique nature of this um, project, does that help? I don't get to vote. So. I know, I know, but I, I like everyone to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and since there's five of us here tonight, there's no way I'll vote on it. So. <laughs> so what other questions? Does staff have any other questions? So this agreement that, um, uh, that we're talking about that we would enter into with the applicant where we have this AMI 30 to 120, does that just everybody that's going to live there has to do it in 30 to 120? Or is there like a, a, a tiered, like you have to have this many in this bracket, this many in this bracket? It, it, will that, that would agree, an agreement get into that detail or? I, I, I don't anticipate it getting into that detail. I think Kim okay. was getting ready to step up, but only because of applicants um, statement earlier that they don't you know they don't know yet crunching the numbers how many it sounds like around 24 are going to be in the 60 percent range but kind of beyond that they're going to have some above and some below and they don't really know that mix yet so i think um this, i don't this, and i don't know that we'd want to hold that mix to sure. be always the same because you know depending on who you know what the demand is you're, that's going to that's going to change at least that's my opinion that's not really a legal opinion but okay with um with this type of housing then and their tax credits are they somehow compensated for having people in that lower bracket i, I just want to make sure that they don't we don't say 30 to 120 and then they just go find people at 120 and fill it up with people like that um how how is it set up so where that they take all people within that range. Sam Betters again. Um, once we are awarded the tax credits, we have to enter into an agreement with Chaffa, specifically identifying the, per, the number of units at 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. And it's recorded in what's called a land use restriction agreement. And that agreement is set in stone for 40 years. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. So, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, I just have one question uh, to follow up on on uh, what Sam said. It, it would be my understanding, and maybe their their council would like to uh, to respond to this that you wouldn't want to enter into an agreement until you actually were awarded credits. So it's not really like we could ink a agreement like next month, and so. Uh, you know, because I'm assuming that with many attainable housing developments, they're using low income tax credits, you might have gaps to fill, even if you're awarded the credits, right, or still need to make things work. So um, I think that we should be careful in saying we'd enter into an agreement because there's still a kind of assumption that those credits are going to be approved um, and that you would likely not want to do that. Is that correct? That's correct, Dan. Once once the credits are approved, we're happy to enter into any agreement with you at that point. They're consistent with that with 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 our with our lower application. So there's been discussion about in the ordinance having some percentage of AMI or some a requirement that they enter into an agreement to win the fee. Yeah. So you're saying that would not work because if you don't get the credits. Mary Elizabeth, can you talk into the mic, please? So my, my suggestion had been to put into the ordinance that, um, you know, applicant will enter into an agreement with the city to limit rental um, prices to 30 to 120% of AMI. But what I think I just heard is you guys would not enter into such an agreement if you do not get your CHAPA funding. Can we word that where I went awarded? I mean, is there a way to word that? We would prefer it to be fun to, to be restricted by the city at the same time that we're restricted by our other agencies. Okay, it so, just makes it cleaner. Yeah, and, and so I just want to clarify for for council. So 
what that would mean is we we you'd be what applicant is saying they could agree to if they did not get funding at all, you know, if they did not get the CHAFA funding, they would not be entering into an agreement to limit the rents. And so then we're back to this statement earlier that you have a PUD that has been approved as is, and it doesn't, you don't have that guarantee. Does that make, am I, am I clear about that? My my suggestion had been to make to have them enter into the agreement regardless, and then <laughs> if they don't get funding, I just want to say, Mary Elizabeth, that I don't own the property, so I can't enter into an agreement on a property I don't own, and I can't restrict the use of the property to the owner. So the timing is essential in that we can't enter into a covenant on the property until we at least own it, and then. Secondly, like I said, it makes a lot more sense to do a, a restrictive property recording all the other ones so that it doesn't get in the way of the financing. So, okay, so Kim, can I ask you this question? Oh, so, I'm going to I'm going to buy the property if I get tax credits in May. Okay, I so so when we talk it. about this date of July first, that's not really unrealistic. If you're talking about you guys still haven't purchased I, the property I don't year. the July first date. But even if it's a even if it's a May first or a June first date or whatever, you still have to purchase property. That's correct. Yeah, the purchase. So the the purchase agreement um, would be contingent on the Chaffa credits being awarded, um, and so. There's, it's kind of like chicken or egg with, with Chapa. We have to show that we're development ready, right? Which includes zoning. So this is a really critical piece of like, okay, do you have a buy right use? And do you have an administrative approval process so that we know that you can pull building permits in 18 months? If there's public hearings, additional public hearings in that 18 months, uh, that's a huge risk for Chapa. Why would they credit, award a project that they know is a huge risk they may not be able to get building permits from. Mm -hmm. So, and then the land deal is kind of the same way, right? So the land's under contract with the hopes that we can get this, get the level of entitlement we need so that we can prove to Chapa that we can get the credits. Um, and then once those credits are awarded, then we know, right, we close and everything moves forward. Um, so it's a little bit tricky uh, with the way that the finance works. So, um, and I know that this is the the zoning is uh, written uh, to help us meet those time frames that Chaffa has, um, and so um, that is a legitimate risk for the city. And I don't know if there's a way to, um, you know, for the city attorney to write some kind of contingency on that, um, you know, so that we can move forward. I would say that we would want to um, be able to move forward with a site plan uh, right away, um, you know, once the zoning's in place is what Chaffa is gonna look for. Cause after, once we still have interview processes to go through too with Chaffa. So it's not just like, okay, we put our application in today. We're still, there's a whole ongoing conversation that's going to be happening, mm -hmm. right? Over the course of this project with them. All right, I wanted to ask or check with Dan. So I guess I want to get timeline or, or cause we're, we haven't even subdivided the land yet. So what are the, what does our timeline look like? What's it take, say we approve this tonight. What does our timeline look like for subdividing the land? Um, cause that goes through public hearing too, correct? Or are you saying that'd be an administrative review? Administrative. That's what's being asked to be administrative also. Okay. So what does the timeline of that look like? Well, it would typically depend on, you know, yeah, the, 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 the applicant and the, and, and the submittal. But uh, um, my guess is that uh, in the conversations I've had with other, other entities and uh, that have uh, processed applications similar to this, there's a pretty significant motivation if you're awarded tax credits to to get the job done uh, within a pretty expeditious period of time. So I would not think that it would be 
anywhere outside of 45 to 60 days for a subdivision plat and the site plan could be could be in conjunction with that and take a little longer. After May 15th, because that's when they know they have the mic. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, after May 15th, so it'd be 45 to 60 days after May 15th. That's when they would know that they have the money and they would, you know, hopefully it, by May 15th have the paperwork ready to just go ahead and submit. Okay, so the land wouldn't be subdivided until after that May 15th award date. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. So for the the requested, just <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> for this the, is how we roll in, Frodo. You're just going to have to get used the to requests, it. Well, in my, my my concern is more if you don't get the chaff of funding. I mean, I love the project if you do, but the requested modifications live with the the PUD rezone. Or that's correct. They the so right. And I, I understand we're saying somebody still has to make this project, but does that mean that they can make the project exactly the same with Market a bunch rate. of VRBOs? Sure. So that, that's concerning to me. There's no way to put a contingency in there that... Well, I mean, that, that was what I was trying to suggest yeah, with right. the, um, you know, making part of the ordinance being entering into an agreement uh, you know, with the city uh, regarding the AMI. Um, but is that that's something legally we can do or can't do? I feel like I'm unclear. Well, we legally to... could, but I'm hearing the applicant say that's not something they can live with. So um, because they can't and they don't want to enter into such an agreement unless they get the the funding. So you you are kind of sitting in limbo between now and May fifteenth as to what's you know whether this is actually going to happen um, as presented. If I could add, it would it be possible to put a contingency on this PUD approval that says if we don't get first or second round chaffer funding, it reverts back to the Bern Heidi PUD. This automatically dissolves. Well, I'm just trying to cover that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. covering as, the concern. As, as you already articulated, like you don't own the property. So, um, so it makes it difficult to to place that burden um, going forward. I just keep thinking, and you know, I, I don't like to do anything on the fly, but it's the subdivision plat. You know, I mean, that's the most binding document that, you know, that we're going to enter in outside of zoning that uh, that would be tied to any sort of plat note or performance or call out any sort of separate agreements that would be recorded um, independent of the of the ordinance or the or the site plan. I just wanted to let the room know that um, our attorney's been raising his hand and he's messaged oh. me and oh. he's been trying to talk and he's paying attention. To oh, oh. oh. That, that's all okay. Right. Can everybody hear me? All okay? right, Alex, are you going to put him up there, Shannon? Can everybody so, hear me? Yes, 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 we can. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. I. I just wanted to explain why I think my client's preference is for option number two. So for the reasons that we've described, we need zoning today to have a competitive CHAP application. We also need an administrative subdivision process in order to be competitive for our CHAP, CHAP application. However, I think that we would be willing to include a condition of approval that either as a flat note or as a condition prior to pulling building permits that the applicant must enter into a long-term affordability covenant in favor of the city. So we can't do that today because we don't own the land. But as a condition of your approval, something like number two, where you add in a requirement that we grant that to the city before we ever start building or as a condition of the sub. Uh, subdivision plat that either one of those scenarios would give the city the assurances that it needs and we can do that. Should have called on uh, uh, yeah we right. should. well that's I mean that's what I was suggesting but but that doesn't solve the issue of um, if the zoning is awarded tonight and the chaffa funding is not awarded then you still have this zoning in place 
their main and without any affordable housing component. And I think that's what council's concern is. But is, is the case that nobody could build on it unless it was affordable? Well, that, um, they, well, right. yes. I mean, so what would happen is somebody would, uh, somebody would get it. I, I, you know, somebody could purchase the property. And I think as Alicia said earlier, they would have to come back and rezone it if they weren't willing to follow through with such a plat note um, about affordability. Does that make sense? Mary Elizabeth, could we include the condition in the ordinance that um, that that note or that that covenant must be in place as a condition of, for example, building permits? I, I didn't catch the last part. Is a condition of the zoning? zoning yeah, the, the zoning is approved. However, in order to get subsequent entitlements, there must be an affordability of covenant in place in favor of the city. Right. That's. I mean, that's what I. That's what I was suggesting all along. So it just that that. <laughs> so can we get some mortgage? Some mortgage? It, yeah. So, it's the vehicle in which it's happening, right? So like the zoning would stay in place, but no one would be able to issue a building permit unless it was affordable. Right. So. So so in this it, so it essentially renders the same result, right? Right. Right. Um, so the zoning would be in place, but for anyone, regardless if it was us or. Uh, a different applicant, you know, right? Not, uh, they would still be burdened to provide affordability to the city, or else they wouldn't be able to pull a building permit. Right. And that's that's huge, right? right. So, well, that's what I was suggesting earlier. But then what I was hearing from these guys is they wouldn't do that. So I got I got confused no, I there. But now it's you I think that's that. something we can live with. But again, it, it, the, remember, if you guys are gone, this goes with the property. And so the property owner, who is not you, it won't be you, has to live with the fact that they are now have property that is burdened by that. That's the issue. They'd have to come in and spend money to amend. I mean, you know. But I mean, it's not, you know, it's not our, it's not the city's job to negotiate the real estate deal, but that's sort of the conundrum. Especially here. this year. Yeah. So Charles Bernheide, if I could have a few minutes. If, could you go back to the options? Charles, can you speak in the mic so we can make sure everybody hears you? Could you go back to the options? <laughs> Can I have my permissions back? <laughs> <laughs> so I know, I know you're going through all the language and the AMI and all that. And that, that, that to me is very confusing and I can see how it would be to you guys too. And, you know, I don't want this property necessarily burdened with continual um, PUDs and things that we got to change every time we look at something. And, and, and in the number two, now that I can see it, it talks about the zoning be approved specific to this application that is proposed. My question tonight is, can you approve it specific to this allocation application, which this application contains all those requirements that all of you guys are talking about and in a roundabout way that all of you are considering this for the affordability reasons? for this specific application. Because I can tell you this, if, if this doesn't get approved, if this doesn't get done, and I appreciate everybody's help and work they've done on it, I'm not in a situation where we're gonna take the land and then sell it to an apartment complex that wouldn't be providing what my dad wanted in terms of affordable housing for teachers, policemen, firemen, people that, you know, that can be in the community it can no longer afford houses here. So I would almost even go further steps to where I would, <clears throat> you know, with and, and in discussions with Dan and Sam with the city, where I would even do something to where if this didn't get approved, the PUD could go back to the existing PUD it is now. Or we go back to a PUD that we discussed even a couple of years ago when we put the school in. So if the biggest danger or your risk is that if this project does not get approved, this PUD is sitting there 
And now we're going to sell the property to some other kind of project that doesn't conform to this application. I can assure you that we're not going to do that. So if you want to go forward with as to be specific to this application proposed, and I don't know how you do that or how you need to, but surely you can figure it out. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. <clears throat> Mayor, would uh, we'd like to request, Mayor, members of council, if if we could have at least five minutes to just discuss uh, with Mary Elizabeth something. We're, there's a lot of things being thrown at us. And well, why don't I, I adjourn us for five minutes? So if anybody needs to take a break or leave and come back, we'll we'll reconvene. It is now nine forty five. So we'll reconvene we do, at nine. We do ten. <laughs> it's actually What's that? a conversation. Ten minutes. Ten.
All right. Sisters. If everybody want to take a seat, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and call the meeting back to order. Um, the time is now 9.59 p.m. and we're going to resume our meeting. So, uh, Mike, we'll turn it over to you to all right, Just thank you. In the right direction. Well, th thanks for giving us that break, Mayor, members of Council. Um, so, just to clarify, I, I think you know, trying to be mindful of the the applicant's risk and being able to, they obviously have risk in what they agree to and uh, to receive. Whoa! So something is. Uh, you're getting that feedback. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so they have risk that we're trying to be mindful of. And they have an outcome. And if if council is wanting to see that same outcome, and if council is comfortable with the concessions being requested, I think we we have a way to address the exposure, considering that those concessions are agreed upon by council to address the the exposure that the city would have if to, uh, what conditions we could make on this if they were not able to perform the full project or receive the funding from. A Chaffa credit. So Mary Elizabeth's just going to cover what those conditions could be considering if that's the direction you're heading. So uh, thanks, Mike. So, I, um, you know, applicant indicated that option two, or do you guys still have the options up? No, oh, can you, Dan, can you put that back up on the screen for us? Sorry, Dan. You don't need the mic to do that, Dan. <laughs> okay, so option option two is to approve the major amend amendment to approve the zoning as presented. So that would be with the um, one entrance, the 75 parking spots, and the administrative review of the subdivision and the uh, site plan. And the proposed condition would be that that site specific site plan and subdivision plat would need to be submitted to the city within 120 days, which gets them past May 15th, um, or the zoning reverts back to the current existing zoning on the parcel. Can I make that motion? No, oh, let's wait. Um, can we hear from Alex, their attorney, or no? Let's, let's, yeah. let's, I want to, I guess I want to have the full discussion before we make a motion. I, I like that. Is there any way we could get till June fifteenth? I'm just trying to think through um, how long it would take. To, sorry, Mary Elizabeth. Sorry, how long it would take for us? I mean, once we get approval, we need time to engineer the plat. I mean, that's going to require, you know, engineers talking to the city, all those kinds of things. So a little more time would be nice. But yes, the, the direction we're going is good. Okay, I think our thought had been that that would be um, something applicant would be working on between now and May 15th. I realized that it could be all for naught if they don't get the funding, but that was sort of a risk, I think, that we felt maybe they could undertake. But uh, that's, I think, a call for council as to whether, you know, you want to make it 150 or, yeah, roughly 150 days. Well, do we put do you call by days or do we do it by a specific date? Or we can do a date. You're correct. So we could either do, um, you know, May 20th, which is kind of where we were going with 120 days, five days after they get the funding, or June 15th. Or July 1st. No, I'm just... <laughs> oh, Stop it. <laughs> uh, July, yeah, the 4th of July holiday. Um, right. So it takes six to eight weeks for us to engineer a site plan. Um, and get a submittal in the door. Typically, the developer uh, won't release consultants to start um, design until those credits are awarded, or else they're on the hook for paying us. We're going to bill them <laughs> for that time. So um, I'm just trying to be nice to my client on that, um, but that's the, that's the reality. So, um, you know, typically, like, credits are awarded and it's like a horse race out the gate, right? We have a kickoff meeting and we get to work. And usually within six to eight weeks, we'll have a first submittal done. Um, so I think that's what the time frame we would want, Alex, and the city, if that's something that would be amenable. 
from so you would be July. Saying, you would, would be say like, like July fifteenth. July fifteenth. I think our team can get it done by July fifteenth. Well, you just have to. We just have to make decisions quickly, and we can do it. I mean, what we heard from you guys earlier is that you will be making things really quickly you because are. you only have, have it. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to. Yeah, I I think we can. I mean, one and I guess one thing would be that you uh, maybe not, that the subdivision plat would have to be submitted within you know by July fifteenth, which does not require the engineering. That's we can do, definitely do that. We can definitely get a we can definitely get a subdivision plat in. Yeah. By then, yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing uh, that we would require uh, on that plat is the, when Chaffa awards these credits, what is their timing for actually deed restricting the property? Do you guys know, does that happen sort of contemporaneously or does that happen at a much later date? At, cl at closing, typically you sign your land use restrictions at your financial closing. Sorry, one thing we had thought about suggesting is that the subdivision plat would include a plat note with a reference to the reception number of the recorded deed restriction. But if that deed restriction is not getting recorded until, you know, everything closes, the, the timing, that requirement doesn't work. So um, oh, the question is, is that what, what's fair to both parties right and so is the G july 15th date a workable date july 15th sounds like it's a workable date for them for if subdivision plat is what is being submitted at that time could you stand up to the mic sorry i'll have, i'll say this again <laughs> yes the applicant can agree to um upon credits being awarded that we would submit a subdivision plat by july 15th to show intent and then and if that subdivision plat is not submitted by july 15th then the zoning would revert back to the existing, the existing zoning meaning that you know you're back it's just back to the way it is to, as of right now right can I make that motion? Well, let's, uh, she's Kim's talking to Charles, so I want to make sure. But Alex, we make does, a that motion, say, does that sound agree. reasonable to you, Alex? Yes, yes, okay. it does. And Dan, how, what do you, how do you feel about that? Dan's idea. Will you speak? Will you speak into the microphone, please? <laughs> um, I, th I think we can make that work. I, re I really do. Um, I'm just trying to a lot of moving parts. I'm just trying to think it all through. Because what I heard is that the adjustments are essentially only being contemplated by council because of the nature of the project. And That's you want some assurances that those outcomes are achieved. If we can't record uh, a deed restriction or some sort of covenant or some encumbrance to the property uh, for is it 18 months until closing, or is that kind of a moving target? All right, well, somebody's gonna have to speak in the mic so we make sure we have all this on record. <clears throat> a, a very quick closing could possibly happen before the end of this year. A more likely closing is probably around uh, about this time next year. <clears throat> and I should And I should say that we're talking about the closing of the partnership agreement. We anticipate if we awarded credits that the closing of the, of the property will occur before, well before that time. <coughs> we anticipate 
closing on the property. Um, when when will your TKO? When will your T, when is the TKO loan approved by? May May thirty first. Yeah. yeah. May thirty first. Okay. So by the time this subdivision site plan would be submitted, Indebuild would be the owner of the property. You know, would know that would have the credits, et cetera. If none of that has happened, July fifteenth is going to blow by, and the zoning reverts back. All right. So I guess my question before we make a motion is: Everybody good with that? Is Indy Bill good? Are you good with that, Kim? <laughs> A subdivision plot. <laughs> she got you. <laughs> All right. All right. With that, I'm going to nope. let um, Heather make a motion. Mary Elizabeth, could you read that lovely language one more time, please? Sure. I well, you want to read the whole thing, Mary Elizabeth? That's and then what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Want me to yeah, and then she'll just say, so moved. Okay, so I'm going to read the whole thing. Start of option two with our new condition. Uh, motion to adopt ordinance 2022-7, an ordinance granting a major amendment to the Burrenhide Plan Unit Development PUD Guide to increase residential density and allowed residential land uses and a portion thereof with the condition that the subdivision site plan and zoning be specific to the application proposed and furnished with a subdivision plat and allow the subdivision and site plan to be reviewed and approved administratively. Such subdivision plat must be submitted on or before July 15th. If such subdivision plat is not submitted by then, the zoning of the property will revert back to the current zoning of the Barrenhide PUD. So moved. Second. Is it too late to ask one last thing? <laughs> no, we can have more. <laughs> no, yeah, you can have discussion. Now. All right. We, the, the motion's on the floor, but yes, you can ask one more question. Uh, liability wise, with the single entrance and exit. <laughs> liability to the city, you mean? Is there, yeah, is there, I mean, are we. Um, I'm not sure what the the liability would, you know, would be if you're thinking about like an emergency situation yeah. or, yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of leave, I'm going to have to So when this topic came up early on in the process, we got with Lower Valley Fire and there wasn't any concern based on the fact that they are sprinkling the buildings. And so I don't see that we have any liability. Thanks. All right, so there is a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, Deputy Poll Council. Councilor O'Brien. Yes. Councilor Bremen. Based on all the work that's gone into the comp plan and motion set prior to or all discussions prior to, yes. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Councillor Cry? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. I want to thank everyone. It's been a long night. Um, not done yet. <laughs> I know we've got to get into ours. So uh, that ends our public hearings for tonight. And we're going to move into our city manager's report. All right. Thank you, Mayor, members, members of council. Uh, just one item. Uh, we'll keep it short. But just to follow up on who will be attending, uh, we have a just a, just a second, Mike. Yeah. Hey, um, we're still having a meeting. If you guys could keep it down or go out in the hallway, that would be awesome. All right, Mike, go ahead. So this Saturday is the Chamber's annual banquet, and the city, as a the, the largest sponsor of the Chamber, uh, has a table uh, with eight seats for that annual banquet, and uh, they are limited in, in seats with the, the demand that they have for the event, and we wanted to know who would be attending. We have to give them the names uh, uh, of who will be attending 
and make sure that they know how many seats are full on the city's table. And uh, my wife and I were planning on going. We're happy to, if, if everybody wants to go and take those seats, that would be totally fine with us. Um, but uh, Ken Cry is not, I, I had mentioned today, he was planning on going with his spouse, but he's not able to attend at this point either, so. I have a table already, so I won't take up any seats, so. Last year, I sat all by myself. <laughs> my, Mike will be there this year. But well, I'm not able to go this year. All right. I'm sorry, I have other plans. I'm sorry. So, and, and not to, the, Looks like the, the pressure is that last year, um, we had a very low attendance as well. And uh, by the time they recognized the city, we didn't have anybody there. I'll be I'll be there this year, Mike, if they recognize the city. That's so. good. That's good. And Mike will be there. Do you have any staff that could attend? We can we can uh, definitely make that invite, but I'm not sure if anybody. Well, you could require your new employee, Mark, right? <laughs> no, he's not here to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can I, and maybe I probably am just missing it, but like, I didn't know the date until I got the email from Deb and I probably missed some other email, but if there was, if there, if it had been brought to my attention, I only announced it a, a month or more ago. Okay. It's my bad. Sorry. So a weekly update for a number of months, I, I think. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good try. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was terrible. So nobody's nobody's nice. able. Okay. So if you have some staff that would like to go, um, okay. Great. Open it up. That's all I have. I don't. All right. Can handle other updates. <laughs> That's good. All right. We're moving into council reports and actions. Ken. Um, downtown board met. I'm uh, sorry. I wasn't prepared for this. Um, we had a good discussion. There was a, uh, somebody there um, uh, who wants to be on downtown board. I, I don't know if we have his application or not yet. Ethan uh, seems interested, works at Hot Tomato, lives in downtown Fruita. Um, Fred from Suds proposed the idea of sort of making a, uh, a locals night downtown, kind of like Hot Tomato and some of the restaurants do. Um, we tried this with Fruit of Fourth Friday a while, uh, a while ago to sort of make a night that encourages people to go do stuff downtown. So we may do some more of that. Talked about uh, Tabor Day, which will be in the spring. Um, I think that's about it for highlights. Uh, agency or yeah, agency hasn't, I don't think met, they didn't meet in January. I think the first meeting is in February. All right. Thanks, Ken. Karen. It wasn't taxpayer day. He said Tabor. Did you say Tabor, Tabor day? day? Yes, taxpayer day. Tabor. Is coming up. It's Tabor. Tabor day. Oh, Tabor, not Tabor, Tabor day. Tabor day? Taxpayer bill like, rights day. Yes. He's not feeling well. <laughs> All right, Karen, you're um, up. Police commission, uh, Kevin Paquette's going to be retiring. And um, so they're getting the protocols in place for different promotions. And uh, yeah, they seem to be doing well. Um, the museum is... Um, they're going through a process of uh, accreditation. And so with that, they're doing um, emergency action plans. So I connected them with um, the chief and then Jim Jackson, who also sits on the <clears throat> commission and uh, is um, experienced with doing emergency plans with um, national parks and stuff. So, um, but the museum's doing well and that's it. It was cool seeing the youth here tonight for for the youth. Um, that was great. So that's that's it. All right, Kyle. Report at this time. Meetings are forthcoming. All right, Heather. Yeah. Matthew. I've got about ten items. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Not in <laughs> Why was it tonight? Nothing? Or, Nothing to report. Oh, all right. Well, I don't have anything. Our tourism uh, meeting was canceled this last month, and I've got chamber coming up. Here, so. uh, the only other question I'm going to throw out to Mike and Shannon, because he's our tech guy, should we get two more mics yeah. just to be, I mean, this, I mean, this is just, it's extra time and, ex, you know. Yes. All right. So <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's get that uh, in there, because... It'll help. And that's all I've got for tonight. Uh, it's 1019. We're going to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good work, everybody.